<laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, we'll get to business if we can, please. Um, first of all, the, the, the normal sort of preamble stuff, if uh, bear with me a moment. Uh, for those, those who are new to the meeting, welcome. Uh, I'll just explain the general process as we go forward. Uh, welcome to today's meeting. This is a public meeting and members of the public and press are permitted to report on the proceedings. Reporting includes filming, photography, making an audio recording and providing commentary on proceedings. Please note this meeting is recorded and streamed live. These recordings are published on the relevant meeting page of the Council's website. By choosing to attend this public meeting, you are deemed to have given your consent to being filmed or recorded and for any footage to be broadcast or published. If the alarm sounds, the premises must be evacuated immediately. Do not spend time collecting personal belongings. All emergency escape routes are clearly signed. Once you have left the building, the assembly point is in the high street opposite the Guild Hall. Members and other speakers are reminded to use their microphone when speaking. Um, I am Councillor James Stanley, I'm Chair of Planning Committee. Um, council officers to my left and right for those who have not been introduced. Um, so, okay, to business. Item one, appointment of substitutes. Margaret? There are no substitutes, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Item two, declarations of interest. Jill. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have an interest in item nine. Um, I'm a local resident to that building, and I'll be speaking as one of the objectors and therefore stepping out of the debate and the vote. That will run essentially, so that's fine. Uh, Karen. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm a ward member for the same application, but I'm coming here with an open mind. Thank, thank you. you. Anyone else? Jenny. Thank you very much. No other declarations of interest? Right, thank you. Um, to the minutes of the previous meeting, I'm just going to go through them by page and then pause when we when I've finished. Page one, two, three, four, and five. Are uh, the contents satisfactory for everyone? Okay, thanks very much. Uh, item four is the minutes of, of the conservationary advisory panel. I don't have copies here, but I'm sure those who were present will make any points they wish to make to the relevant officers in due course. Thank you. This morning, we uh, item five. This morning, we visited um, the, the location of the 44 to 40, 42 to 44 Barbon Road application, uh, and members had a walk around the, the site, etc. And I'm sure were ask the, all the relevant questions they wish to ask. Um, moving to item six, public participation, Margaret. There's no public participation, Chair. And seven, public representation. Yes, Chair, there is public representation. Agendas items eight and nine, and Councillor Udall is speaking as ward member on items eight and ten. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, Richard. Um, so to the first application, St. Clement's Church Hall. Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Let's get the, um, the slides up and running. Just going to skip through because um, I've got the slides in the the wrong order. I've got Barbourne first, so so members, this application was reported to last month's planning committee and was deferred for additional information. And for for members who were not in attendance, um, we'll run through the presentation. The application relates to the site of the St. Clement's Church Hall, which is accessed from St. Clement's Gardens, lying to the east of Henwick Road. The hall itself was constructed around 1909 and is a single storey structure surrounded by scrub and glass, grassland. The site is surrounded by main residential uses within St. Clement's Church to the north and 
grade two listed, which is a grade two listed building, along with the frontage wall and the memorial, which are listed in their own right. St Clement's House and 30 Henwick Road are also grade two listed buildings. And you can see they're starred, the, the grade two listed buildings. Some photos of the site. Um, the access road to the, the side is that serves the, the church and the church car park. That is outside the application site. And that's the second picture is looking to the rear of the, the site. This is the rear area. As you can see, it's um, overgrown with a bit of grass and scrubland. This is looking from the front of the site and you can see the front gable um, and the side area to the side of it. That's the access track again. And we've got some aerial photos just looking down onto the church hall, which is in the, the middle, um, surrounded. Uh, this is looking from Henwick Road and then looking back towards the site and the, the church hall is in the shadows just by the trees. The proposal seeks for the demolition of the existing church hall and the construction of a four-storey building to provide a, a, a building contain, th sorry, let me start that again, a four-storey building containing 54 bed student accommodation. This will be provided in 14 separate cluster units containing three, four and five ensuite bedrooms with a communal kitchen and living space. And the floor uh, plans, so that's the ground floor um, and of note is the cycle space and bin storage. And then pretty much the, the same type of clusters units on first floor, second floor and third floor. The proposals also provide amenity space and landscaping to provide it to the north, east and west of the site. Postal has attracted a number of comments from residents both objecting and supporting the proposal, and these are summarised in the report at paragraph 6.1. Members will note that there are no consultee objections as part of the, the consultation process. The current building has been vacant for some time and despite marketing since 2015, no community groups or operators have expressed any interest in the site, leading to the current proposal being tabled. It is considered that when taking account of policy SWDP 37 in respect to community buildings, the weight is in favour of the redevelopment of this site. The building is located at the lower level of the properties in Henwick Road and the building is located centrally within the site and allows adequate separation distances between the building and the neighbouring properties. This, along with the stepping in of the third floor, allows the building to provide it without resulting in any adverse impact or domination of the surrounding properties. Landscaping is proposed to the boundaries of the site that will provide some additional screening and filtering of any views from the adjacent properties. The lighting assessment has demonstrated that the building will not impede on the provision of sufficient daylight to the existing buildings and also for future uses of the proposed building. All habitable room windows are located to the north and south of the building. So that's the picture of the daylight assessment. And as you can see, there are no windows located on that elevation and any windows which are facing towards the, um, the elderly flats are um, therefore the stairwells and they are obscure glazed. So, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. In elevation terms, the building would be constructed of a palette of materials, including Worcester red brick, buff brick, render, composite and rain, rain screed cladding, and a standing seam metal roof cladding. Members will notice that there is a condition which requires the submission of all materials, and so those materials are not accepted in their current state. They will need to be submitted as materials for consideration by officers. And members considered last time as part of the discussion, and again, it's for members to look at as part of their discussion of whether those materials proposed are acceptable or whether there is a, a different um, composite which members wish to suggest in terms of a palette of materials, but ultimately they will be for approval by officers. The arrangement of the facing materials, as you can see, expresses the buildings horizontally and, and provides that, that horizontal emphasis. Building 
is four storeys in height, but given the difference in levels between the site and Henwick Road, it provides a suitable stepping up of the th from the three-storey Dancock's house to the properties in Henwick Road. So you can see there the levels difference, and you can see that the third storey is, is cut away to provide that separation distance. And again, we've just, that we showed last time, the, the form of the building in relation to Henwick Road. Um, this is additional photo um, and a, a photo montage which you won't have seen previously. This has been submitted since the Blask Planning Committee by the applicants to be able to show how it will fit in with the surrounding area and that aerial view. And also a photo montage of how it would sit looking from the properties from Dancock's house and others. It's considered by officers that when viewed in the context of the surrounding area, the design and detailing and height is considered to be wholly appropriate and will provide an overall visual enhancement to the surrounding areas. You'll also see from the roof plan that the building will provide a green roof and photovoltaic arrays as part of the scheme. And the design ensures that at least 10% of the energy required of the building will be met by renewables and that measurable gains to ecology will be met. Whilst the building is not on the national or local list as a historic building, it is acknowledged that the building is of some historical interest given its age and connection with the church. Is it accepted that there will be a minor impact on the designated heritage assets of St Clement's Church, St Clement's House and 30 Henwick Road that results in a less than substantial harm and that is at the lower end of the levels. In line with the requirement in the MPPF, this harm has, is weighed in the report against the public benefits of the development and the loss of the existing building has not received objection from the conservation officer. A suitable recording is, a, is suggested as a suitable approach to record the building's history, along with an interpretation board, which is suggested as part of the conditions. One of the main concerns expressed by residents is that of parking and access. And the development is proposed with no cars um, off street to be provided. This is a suitable approach as it is 0.8 of a mile from the city centre and Fourgate Street railway station and the University City campus. It's one mile from the St John's campus and half a mile from the University's Berry, Barrows house. The shopping centre of St John's is also in close walking distance. You can see those elements which are starred and located there and St John's is in the uh, star shape um, shape. So um, not only that, there are bus stops that are in close proximity on Henwick Road and St John's and suitable cycle routes exist linking the site. This approach to providing no cars on site helps reduce carbon emissions, which is important given the citywide AQMA and particularly the issues in St John's. A car and parking management um, strategy has been provided in draft <coughs> and a condition is recommended to allow this document to be formally tied to the planning commission. This will dictate management of arrivals and departures of students at the start of the end of term, along with the arrangements for visitors. And members will have received a letter from the applicants outlining those management requirements and those are also included with the, in the updated report. It is the applicant's um, suggestion and they will have suggested that, it will, that they will put tenancy agreements on all students, which will include a cause that will restrict them keeping a vehicle on site or within one kilometre of the site. To give an idea of members of what a one kilometre from the site looks like, there is an aerial uh, view which shows the one kilometre radius. And probably a little bit more helpful is a map to show that one kilometre radius. And I would reiterate, this has been suggested by the applicants as their way of dealing with the concerns that have been raised and will be met as part of the tenancy agreements. Cycle parking is provided at the ground floor level at a ratio of one space per resident. Access to the site will be from the existing car, from the existing from St. Clement's Gardens. Improvements to the existing access to the church car park will be provided through the repositioning of the building. The Highway Authority does not object to the application and recommends conditions 
but also a financial contribution is set out in paragraph 7.74 and the draft heads of terms are in appendix one. These are accepted by the applicant and are considered by officers to meet the tests within regulation 122 of the, the SIL regulations. Overall, the scheme is acceptable from a highways perspective. As part of the consultation responses, Worcestershire Acute Hospitals NHS Trust has set out also requests for contributions. The officer report sets out in detail the full consideration of that contribution, taking account of all relevant matters, including the recent legal decisions at Leicestershire, the consistent stance across Worcester, South Worcester authorities, including this authority in previous decisions, and the application of the tests as part of the SIL regulations. It is concluded that taking all matters into account, that contributions should not be sought for this development. The planning balance considers the improvements, enhancements, along with the economic, social and environmental benefits that will flow from the scheme as public benefits will outweigh the minor harm to the historic environment. It is concluded that the scheme provides significant benefits across all three dimensions of sustainable development and the scheme is considered to be wholly acceptable and compliant with the development plan. The application is recommended for delegated approval subject to the signing of the section 106 agreement based on the draft heads of terms and the conditions as listed within the report. Thank you, Chair. Paul, thank you. Um, so the process for the, just for the benefit of our guests at the back of the room is that we would now go to the contribution by the board councillor, then I would invite members, uh, guests to step forward to the table and uh, make their contribution, and then we will open it up for a wider debate. So with that, um, Councillor Udall. Thank you, Chair, and I'll also be, be willing to answer any questions members have as well after I've given my presentation. Mm -hmm. Mr Chairman, I spoke at length at the last meeting about my objections to this application. I don't intend to say it all over again. However, the building is, in my opinion, in the opinion of many of the local residents, a significant overdevelopment of the site. Four storeys in height will overdominate and overshadow the three-storey Dancox House and Rowland House and Russell House, which are immediately adjacent to it, especially Dancox House, which is on a lower gradient which is three story. The intergenerational mix is not good. This is the largest sheltered housing complex in the West Midlands. Pensioners and students have very different expectations and this application will devastate their quiet community. The building is to be unstaffed with no security, making any management plan unenforceable. The proposed cycle storage area is directly next to Russell and Rowland House sheltered housing scheme. Noise and disruption of cycle storage, especially at night, will be significant. South facing windows of the development will overlook sheltered housing schemes, especially Rowland House, Russell House and Merrick House. Three car parking spaces is totally inadequate. I understand they are for staff only, so no hope of disabled parking, car clubs, or any other imaginative approaches to car sharing. It's easy for any student or any resident to get around any proposed car ban. The car just needs to be registered in somebody else's name, probably their parents' name, and this will be done anyway, normally for insurance purposes, with children being added as a named driver. That will get them around any ban on vehicles on the site. 54 student flats will create the need for 54 car parking spaces. It's unrealistic in the extreme to imagine that none of these students will have cars or will not have visitors and friends and family with cars. Indeed, many students are medical students, including student paramedics. They have, to, they have work experience, often doing long shifts and often in places away from Worcester. They commute from their homes to work and back to the university with their cars. St. Clement's Close already has parking problems and could not be considered for a residence parking scheme. It already has more residential cars than available spaces. Even if the students do all have cycles and use a cycling facility, they'll have to access it via a very steep, narrow footpath with a cycling prohibition. Do we seriously expect every student to dismount and push their bikes or will they continue to endanger the health and safety of pedestrians, many of whom are elderly, and compete with space for them to cycle on a very narrow footpath? 
The accommodation is too tiny. It's far too small for student life. We have no garden space and will encourage students to overspill into the communal areas of the sheltered housing scheme, creating a risk of antisocial behaviour or perceived antisocial behaviour. These are not student flats. They really resemble prison cells. No garden space, no recreation space, and no space for disabled residents. Construction and demolition would be a nightmare for residents. Please remember many existing residents are housebound and confined to their flats. They have no escape from the noise, dust, and disruption of construction. This is totally unfair and wrong. All construction vehicles would have to use a very narrow single track road to access the site. The reality is that they won't. They will overspill into neighboring streets. So extra conditions are needed, ensuring all construction vehicles are off the highway, conditions to limit the hours of operation and construction, conditions to control noise, dust and vibration, and to ensure no evening or weekend working. The application is totally inappropriate for this site. It's wrong, it's cruel, and it's unfair. Residents are fearful. Residents are coming to the end of their days. They should be given much more respect and should not have to consider having to move from their home to escape this nightmare. For years, this has been a community facility. Many people believe it should be a listed building. It is important to the local area and is the last surviving building of the old St. Clement and Tybridge Street housing area, which was mostly demolished as in the slum clearances of the 1950s. Chairman, the hall needs to be preserved. I ask you to reject this application. Uh, Richard, thank you. Um, Andy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, arising from, from what Richard's just said, I, I'd like to speak later, if I may, but just on a, a point of clar clarification from Paul. Um, if you look uh, from the, 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 the Riverside or, or, or beyond towards St John's, um, obviously it, the, the, the skyline, the townscape, as it were, uh, is dominated by uh, uh, Dancock's house and Russell House, and, and not not a bad thing these days since they, it was changed. I always think they, they, they look rather handsome in a way. Um, but if you come round, uh, there's a row of houses which are actually opposite the Grosvenor on Hemmick Road, and you can see those. Now these this building will sit in front of those, and I I couldn't get from the very uh, I'm sure it was there, but I just didn't get it quickly enough. From the photographs, if you're looking up from towards uh, the west, from the riverside, will this will this stand there and be another sort of feature of the skyline, or will it will it merge into the uh, 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 will it stand above and be different from, or will it merge into the general view? Through you, chair, from. From officer's point of view, the, the building has been designed so that it steps up from Dancock's house towards the properties in Henry Road. So from an officer's point of view, we feel that it will contribute to the, the overall streetscape, that it won't be a dominant feature, that it will, will merge in, uh, as you've suggested. But that's, that's our, our view. And uh, if that didn't come across in the presentation, um, perhaps we, we, we could have a another look at the presentation and, and show you, but uh, that's certainly officer's view that it will merge, that it won't be standing out above the, the existing streetscape. Yeah, I'm, I'm reassured that it's been, been taken into account. Um, I would like to comment uh, later on, on another matter, if I may. So at that point, can I, I want to ask Richard if he could just step back in, into the public spaces, so to speak, and then in, invite uh, Mr. Williams and Mr. James to the table, please. Gentlemen, welcome. Um, just for the benefit of everyone in the room, uh, you are the agents for the applicants, essentially. Is that correct? Okay, thank you very much. So what you have is five minutes. You can subdivide that as you will. Uh, uh, George, to my right, will indicate at a point where you're running out of time, essentially, but the floor is yours. Uh, oh, sorry. Yep. The scheme which is now before you is a scaled down version of our original proposals. It has been reduced in size from a building accommodating 76 students to a building for 54 students. These changes reflect the positive comments which we received from your officers 
at the pre-submission stage of the project. 15 metres from existing properties to the east and west, and 24 metres from Russell House to the south. Its height will be lower at its boundaries with neighbouring properties, and the highest part of the building will be in the centre of the site. Its overall height will not be dissimilar to other buildings in the area. All habitable windows will be orientated north and south so that the closest properties adjacent are not overlooked. The applicant is an experienced developer of a student accommodation. It has developed many student schemes in city centres, including the former Images nightclub site on the Butts. These sites require an experienced approach to construction in order to minimise disruption. Vehicle management is clear, clearly a concern which has been raised by local residents and members of this committee. However, these concerns can be addressed and they can be managed. The applicant will enforce a car-free parking policy, as you've heard. The lettings policy will prevent students bringing cars to site or to park vehicles within one kilometre. Vehicle movements and access to the site will be managed on the day when students move into the accommodation and when they leave at the end of term. There are three parking spaces on site, but their use will be restricted. Students will be contacted ahead of the arrival and departure dates. They will be allocated a time slot to access one of the three spaces. Their arrival and departure will be monitored by the management team. Your officers have proposed that we agree a formal car management plan and demolition and construction logistics plan to discharge planning conditions seven and nine. These details will be agreed in consultation with the highway authority. Chair, your officers have correctly applied the tilted balance test and concluded that there are no adverse impacts which would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits of the proposed development. This is in the context of a sub five year housing land supply position. The proposals will make use of a brownfield site within the urban area at a location which will conveniently place students close to local facilities and the university campus. It will result in environmental improvements by replacing a redundant building with a modern contemporary design. It will bring economic benefits for those who will work on its construction and will increase footfall to local businesses. It will also provide purpose built student accommodation to meet an identified need without having to convert family housing stock into HMOs. In conclusion, the proposal strike the right balance between making the effective use of land for development in a sustainable location whilst protecting the amenities of the local area. We therefore invite you to support this scheme and to grant planning permission. I'm accompanied by Mr. Peter James, uh, his managing director of the company who will be responsible for the construction and management of the project post completion. And Peter can assist you with questions relating to the operational and management of the student accommodation. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed. Opportunity now for members to ask focus questions of um, Mr. Williams and Mr. James. Alan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could just ask Mr. Round to put up the slide on the radius on the issue of the parking, I'd be grateful. That's the one, that, that previous, that one, that one, yeah. Um, Mr. Williams, um, you're talking about the parking issue, um, which you don't seem to think will be an issue because of this um, condition. Um, can you tell me in some detail how you're going to enforce that? Is it, for example, um, people walking around that massive area, checking up, you know, with a piece of paper, checking up on registrations? And then if you find a car with a registration that shouldn't be there, what action do you take? I think you say three strikes and you're out so you can park illegally or have a car there for three times before anything's happened. But are you seriously suggesting 
staff are going to walk around that area regularly and check up on everybody's number plate. And if you find one that shouldn't be there, you're going to do something about it. No, that's not what's going to happen. I, th I think if I may invite Peter to uh, answer that question uh, and to relate it back to schemes that his company have actually um, have in, in, in operation where they've, in, they, they've imposed this sort of restriction. Yeah, Peter. yeah happy to do so. Um, so we own and operate uh, 30 uh, student schemes, um, all in a city. Um, we do not have parking at any of our schemes other than, like in this instance, there are three parking spaces which are used solely for student tenancy turnovers. Um, when the students arrive at our schemes or depart, they have to book a slot to do so and have to register with us the vehicle which will be used when they arrive at those schemes. Within uh, um, the majority of our tenancy agreements um, for the schemes we currently operate, there is a clause which specifies that it is a car-free scheme. We don't expect them to bring cars and we don't expect them to use or park their cars within a kilometer um, of the accommodation if indeed they do bring them. Um, we do, um, as opposed to what John just said, uh, we will send our management team around the area uh, to, to, to check the cars and we will do it on a reasonably regular basis. Um, our experience, I have to say, because we only develop in uh, inner cities, is we do not have a problem with students bringing cars to a ski, uh, to, to accommodation when there is no parking. I think most people will accept that you know, other than a house, a vehicle is probably the most expensive asset that anyone will buy in their lifetime. So unless they have somewhere secure to park a vehicle, they don't bring them. And, you know, th this accommodation and all of our accommodation is conveniently placed for their academic studies. So we do not have issues in the unlikely events that we do, as um, Councillor Ramos has alluded to, we have a three strikes policy, which is you get a warning. If you do nothing about it, you get a second warning at, along with your parents or guarantors. If you do it again, we terminate the tenancy. I can tell you in 15 years of owning and managing student properties, we have never had to t terminate the tenancy on grounds of them breaching their tenancy agreement whether that is for car parking, noise, or any other matter. So, you know, all I can say is, based on our experience, we don't see this as a problem because the students, we don't expect them to bring their cars. They're here to study, not... You can here just have the uh, picture up again, the, the radius. Um, I admire you, obviously, you're, you're, I think you're living in a different world to the one I live in in Worcester in terms of student cars. Uh, students do have cars, as a matter of fact. So my concern, Mr Chairman, is the enforcement of it, because you can put anything in the tenancy agreement. We've got, I think, seven pages of conditions. They're only as good as the enforcement of them. And I'd just like to drill down, if I may, specifically on what you're going to do to enforce it, because that is a massive area. I mean, um, how often are your officers going to walk around with a notepad and take note of cars? I mean, are they going to walk all of those streets? And how often? Because this is a serious issue. Because if that's not enforced, then we've got the problem that many of us fear is going to happen. But the idea that you had no problems could simply be with respect is that because the thing is not being enforced, so you don't have any problems. If this is not enforced, you won't have any problems as such problems will be borne by the residents. So I do want to know, Mr. Chairman, because this is critical to this application, how is this going to be enforced? I'm not interested in other cities. I'm interested in Worcester, because I know Worcester, and I know students in Worcester, obviously nowhere else in the country, but students in Worcester have cars. OK, can, um, can I ask Councillor Ramos then to help me out here and identify how many of those streets within that area, which actually, in uh, in a kilometre radius, there aren't that many streets 
how many of those streets already have parking restrictions on them? And could I also ask, on what basis are you assuming that all students have cars? Because I certainly don't have any empiric evidence I can provide you to say that students do have cars. All I can tell you is from 15 years experience, they do not bring their cars to our schemes because we have a no parking policy. Well, my concern, Mr. Chairman, is actually I'm asking the questions, not answering them. But my concern is if, if the applicants don't know what roads are restricted and not restricted, they don't know what the job is going to be of having to enforce the parking. And as for students not having sorry. cars, uh, sorry, sorry, students, Council, Councillor Remus, that, that isn't that, the case. Sorry, you, we've identified what, what the job is. Well, I'm not going to argue the point as a matter of fact that students uh, in Worcester have cars. We've had 10 years to 15 years experience of this. So that's the given. What is not given is the enforcement of this. Clearly, the applicants, Mr. Chairman, do not know which roads have restrictions and which do not. So they don't know the task ahead of them. So I'll leave the question open, which is that they don't know how they're going to enforce that. And that is my concern. With all due respect, Councillor Amos, we do know the size of the problem, and it's there for everyone to see. With oh, respect, Mr Chairman, I, just, I was just asked how many streets have restrictions because the applicant didn't know. But, but it's irrelevant, Councillor Amos. That is the area, whether those streets have restrictions or not. That is the gentlemen, area gentlemen, we said gentlemen. we will police. Okay. Uh, can I, other questions, please? But questions and then answers and not... Please refrain from speaking over one another. Uh, Councillor Alcott. Chair, thank you. I think just to briefly comment, I did work at University of Worcester for quite some time and they do have quite a different demographic in that they have a lot of student nurses and they have um, students doing PTCEs and, and they have a lot of mature students. So, so it does tend to vary. And I know the nursing students work, they work a lot, a lot of hours. They start early, they finish late and it, and it does kind of differ. I just wanted to... Just a bit. But my general question is, um, obviously you've talked about car parking, but obviously there are a lot of elderly residents and, and schemes. With the management scheme, is, is there anything to deal with, I guess, will that cover concerns over noise and that sort of thing? Thank you. Yeah, um, again, Councillor Alcott, within our tenancy agreements, there is a specific clause which deals with noise nuisance, and it is policed in exactly the same way as the car clause is policed three strikes and you're out. So if we have a noise, uh, if we have a complaint of um, the, the, the tenants being noisy, then our management staff go and speak to them. They get a warning, they repeat, they get another warning. If they do it a third time, then we terminate the tenancy. Again, as I've said, 15 years into this, you know, managing over a thousand beds, we have never had to term terminate the tenancy on grounds of noise, cars, or any other matter. Yeah, I've got them, uh, Pat Agar and then uh, Councillor George Sayer. Pat. Thank you. Um, on, on the subject of possible noise and nuisance, uh, bearing in mind that, that there are quite a number of vulnerable people living nearby, uh, uh, Councillor Udall mentioned that the facility you're, build, you're hoping to build uh, will not be staffed at night. Is that correct? We we, 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 because of the size of the facility, we do not find it necessary to staff any of our facilities. However, what we do have, and I think I explained it in a letter which I sent to you councillors, we have a local management presence um, with a company called Move GB, but we also have a security and safeguarding presence provided by a company called Relyon. And we provide those numbers to residents, and they're, they're displayed in the um, uh, in the accommodation. If there are any issues, then those people turn up at you know whatever hour of the day it is. That's the whole point of having the twenty-four hour cover. Between nine and five, it would be our own staff. Um, between the hours of five and nine the following morning, we rely on the local presence and rely on security to provide that. <clears throat> So uh, they're not making uh, passes uh, around the site at all. They're actually on call on the helpline, some kind of helpline. The security company occasionally make passes on site because it is a security company as well. Right. 
and the other staff who are on call, they would not do so. Sorry? The other staff who are on call overnight would the not do that. The other staff would respond to issues, yes. Right, so thank you. if there you. was a noise complaint, they would okay. turn up and deal with a noise complaint. Councillor de Sewa. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a similar question, but actually I'll change it now to ask about the daytime. So there are daytime staff there, is that correct? Yeah, the daytime staff who would be, we, we team that with GP who have a presence here in Worcester and would GP provide that daytime cover. Could I ask how many staff? Sorry? How many? Uh, would GP, um, I don't know they are. Um, and it, uh, it's sort of a, a property agency who operate here in Worcester. Um, I think they've got um, offices in Birmingham, Cheltenham and Gloucester. No, no, I meant, uh, sorry, I meant, just to be clear, I meant how many staff in the day would be at this site of theirs? Uh, there won't be any staff at the site. We don't have staff on site, uh, on any of our schemes. Okay. But I'm sorry, I was confused, and I thought you said at one point that mm -hmm. there were daytime staff, but not nighttime staff, so my misunderstanding there. No, not on site, but... They're based locally. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any more questions or comments to the applicants? Councillor Barnes. Thank you. I walk past this site on a regular basis um, to get into town, so I know the area very well. And I don't consider it in the city. Um, the area is residential, it isn't in a city. For information you obviously need, the Henrik Road does have a parking scheme on it, and areas like Ingalls Drive don't have any parking restrictions, so I can imagine that that area will fill up with cars really quickly, um, in, potentially at least. And of course, the Riverside campus and half the university, well, almost all the university sites come into that one kilometre. So again, I'm not quite sure how you can manage that. I'm also concerned about the on-site um, situation. How quickly, if there's a problem, will people be able to get to that site to sort it out, please? Within the letter I circulated to councillors, I think I gave um, an example of an issue we recently had on a site in Bristol. Um, where a fire alarm went off and the safeguarding company was there within 15 minutes. So I would expect a similar situation to apply here. Okay. So then, Councillor Lewin. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I've got um, two main issues really with this. The first issue being that there's no garden, so the communal spaces are going to be used regardless of you saying yes or no because if it's sunny outside, surely the students want to have a barbecue or they want to sit outside. And my second issue is because there's freshers in September, obviously they're two worlds apart. A 90 year old is not, not going to want to hear loud music or people coming back at four o'clock in the morning. And if you're drunk, you're not going to care. If someone's telling you to be quiet, you're going to tell them to go away in essence. So do you think that them two are going to be an issue? Yes or no? Um, again, I can only refer to the 30 schemes we own and manage elsewhere, which are all in very similar locations, whether this one is regarded as a city or not. Um, and I'm not saying we have never had any issues, uh, but we do not experience those issues on a regular basis. I'm actually quite amazed that um, people have such a dim view of students. I'm sure there are lots of people sitting around this table who have been students themselves who probably wouldn't necessarily share that view. You know, we, we've already been told that a lot of the students here in Worcester are student nurses, doctors, paramedics, medical staff, who personally I would regard as very sensible individuals who are here to learn and study and, you know, um, further their academic career. Yes, occasionally they are going to have parties, but I don't, I you know, in any of our other schemes, it is not a regular occurrence and we do not have issues with noise. Sorry, I was just wanted to be supplementary. Um, are the rest of your schemes around vulnerable adults or people of, of a certain age? They vary, sorry. They vary because we have 30 schemes. I couldn't tell you, Councillor Titter, whether you know, 
we, we have a residential home within close proximity. Um, in fact, I think there is one um, on Wells Way in Bath, which has a care home across the road. So, so the answer is yes, um, we do have schemes where. Uh... Please, and, and, and if, if I can just um, uh, answer your point about um, outside amenity space. I think it's, you know, it's, 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 it's got to be acknowledged here that, you know, this site is a, is, is a four minute walk from a very large public park. So you, you, you can foresee a situation in terms of you know, a beautiful day like it is today, that students will migrate to the public park. I think that then it's going to cause issue at a public park when they're drinking or, do you know? No, but they might not enforce that when they... I, I would like to think um, and give more students the benefit of the doubt um, and assume they are responsible adults. So, thank you. Karen Lewin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a question about the three car parking spaces. Um, they're going to be used for uh, drop-off and pick-up, and the rest of the time they're going to be pretty empty. Would you be willing to look at letting some of those spaces have a car club space that we've got elsewhere in the city and then if you do have a student that needs a car they can just join the car club and use the car if they need it um again i don't think we would have a problem with that um you know as i keep emphasizing our schemes are meant to be car free we we only need the spaces or utilize the spaces for student tenants to turn overs in fact we currently have a scheme in bath which we are building which does have a car club space, so I can categorically say we wouldn't have an objection to that. Uh, and I also think that um, um, Councillor Oodle, when he made his um, presentation to you, I think he was on, on the misunderstanding that those those three spaces would be reserved for staff. I think that's what he said. That's not the case. No. Uh, and indeed, you know, it, you know it's, it's quite possible that we could actually allocate one or more of those three spaces for disabled as well. So if we do have a student, um, who has a disability then there's a facility there yeah and again we we, we have a scheme or two schemes three schemes um in bath and bristol which have disabled spaces further comment or questions to the applicants right means your seats at the back uh we will um proceed so um obviously uh, any further questions or comment relating to the application please Alan Amos. thank you chair uh, qu questions some uh, uh, comments uh, first a question i think is the simplest one um i'm advised that the existing st clement's church hall is currently under review by historic england for listing status is that correct um through you chair i'm not aware of that um and I can certainly make inquiries, but certainly that hasn't been raised to us by our conservation officer, that we're not aware of that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. In that case, we'll park that one where it is. Uh, can I just come on to the question of parking? Because clearly it's a, it's a fundamental issue with this. Um, I'm interested in Highway's comments on paragraph 3.7. It talks about car free. Now, unless something's happened, it's not illegal to own a car. I know some people would like to make it illegal to own a car, but at the moment it isn't illegal. And therefore, people, believe it or not, have cars, and believe it or not, they have to park them somewhere. They don't disappear into the thin air um, at certain times of the day. Um, and my first question to Highways is, really, it's just the evidence, um, because clearly Worcester appears to be unique in this country and unique in the world, that we've got all these people coming in, and every single one is going to want a bike, and everyone is going to use it. Uh, which is interesting um, because 54 spaces. Now, we've been told about the lack of green space, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I don't generally like accommodation which has no green open space because where do people go? They don't all sit indoors watching the television. So what is the evidence, which is that if you have 54 students, everyone needs a bike, so you need cycle storage, and everyone's going to use the bike. And that's for people who clearly don't know Worcester, 
um, most bus services finish around six o'clock. So I don't know what Stuart's going to do in the evening at weekends. Um, perhaps um, somebody can tell us that. Um, the, the next point, Mr. Chairman, on that is highways comments in paragraph. Well, actually, it's um, it's uh, uh, let me. No, I think I'll leave that that point there. If we can then move on to the objections. Um, 34 representations and three petitions. Now, I know it's not by the number that matters. It's got to be the quality and the relevance of the objections. Um, but what do, what do the local residents say? I mean, they live there. They're going to be affected, so we need to listen to them. They've said that the car-free development will not be practical or enforceable. Um, it then goes on to talk about um, the context where there are other developments going on in the area which are not providing car parking. So the context is that you've already got a difficult situation being made worse, and this will simply add to it. And then the residents go on to talk about parking provision and the impact of parking in the nearby streets. Um, and it's interesting also that the uh, residents parking scheme that is, has been introduced in the Arboretum one of the reasons for that, Mr. Chairman, was because of the parking of student cars. But students don't have cars in Worcester. But one of the reasons for the Arboretum parking residence scheme was the parking of student cars. It's interesting, isn't it? Interesting. Um, and on the question of the radius, which and I did try to get answers, but I was met with um, sort of unhelpful answers, if I can put it politely. Um, but no, but no answer, Mr. Chairman. No answer. Um, we don't know how often. People are going to be walking around with a bit of paper checking on car registrations, how many staff they've got to do all this. Certainly, we don't know the frequency. Are they going to do it every month or whatever? The truth is, Mr. Chairman, I'm not an idiot. It's not going to happen. And we all know it's not going to happen. And so one of the things that object to this is the dishonesty of it. No green areas. If we could move on to the, the second question, not, not just parking. Um, Oh yes, uh, um, highways are going to tell me about the need because in paragraph 7.79, they say this development needs 54 safe and secure cycle spaces would be facilitated to meet the needs. But what's the evidence that we need 54 safe and secure cycle spaces? And this, of course, every student is going to have a bike and every student is going to use it. Um, then we come on, Mr. Chairman, nobody's mentioned this, and it's a source of great concern. The NHS, if we look at paragraph 7.106 and 7.107, I'll just, just uh, read out one sentence to summarise the point. NHS are saying, this is the NHS, we do respect the NHS, existing service infrastructure for emergency and planned healthcare is unable to meet the additional demand generated by the proposed development. The new population associated with the proposed development individually and cumulatively will impact significantly on the capacity of service delivery and performance of the trust. It then goes on to say 7.107, this development will have a detrimental impact on the trust's ability to continue to deliver services within required quality standards and timeframes. So we're gonna go ahead and vote for it. And the final point, Mr. Chairman is, yeah, as always, Mr. Chairman, as always. Um, uh, when we come on to conditions, these are the things that you can put on and the next planning committee, you can take them off. So they're not worth the paper they're written on. We've actually got seven and a half pages of conditions. It's a pretty secure, safe, you know, reliable application this. So we've got seven and a half pages of conditions and 31 conditions. And we're, you're telling me, or somebody's telling me that the one on parking is going to be enforced. Mr. Chairman, this is a disaster. It's very unfair on the local residents um, and people who want it are clearly in cloud cuckoo land because students don't have cars. Thanks very much. Karen, did you want to speak on anything connected to the highways questions? Thank you, Chairman. I'll, I'll say something I, I'm sure I won't make uh, Councillor Amos happy and I'll be repeating some comments. I've, I've been trying a long time, Alan, and I know I fail, but here goes. Um, firstly, I don't recall we've ever said that students don't own cars, um, but parking free 
uh, student accommodation is common across the country. There are students that will own a car and students that don't own a car. And some students that own a car will choose to bring it to university and choose to bring it to university in Worcester. We would expect those students to find accommodation which does benefit from car parking because there is quite a bit of student accommodation that does have parking. Um, here, as you've already heard from the applicants, there will be tenancy agreements in you know before you go to university you know that there is nowhere for you to uh, park your car you may choose not to come and study in Worcester for that reason or you, as I said you will choose to find accommodation where you will be able to park your car either within the curtilage or close by in, um, in, in a car park one of the many car parks that Worcester has so as I said it, it's common we are not saying students do not own cars and we know that Worcester as I think Councillor Alcott has already pointed out Worcester is slightly different to some other universities in that there are probably more students that own a car because of the nature of the courses that take place there and we accept that and as i said we have never said that students don't own cars but not all students do own cars sorry to bang on about it my daughter's at university does not own a car and all the other 19 people in the student accommodation that she shares um relation to cycle parking uh, the the standard that we've asked for i mean we've asked for it because it's in conformity with our streetscape design guide now again not all students may choose to own a, a cycle and they may not choose to cycle but we'd like to put the provision there because clearly what we need to be doing in line with government advice is that by 2030 50 percent of all short journeys within towns and city centers we want to make those by um walk or cycle so if we can put the facilities in place to enable students residents and everybody to make that change then that that's what we would do to try and encourage that change to take place. I'm not sure there's anything else I can add. Is there anything you wanted to raise? Um, <clears throat> just in respect of two, two points in terms of amenity space. There is some amenity space to the rear of the property. It's not without amenity space. There is an area of amenity space to the rear of the development. Yeah. Could you put the slide up? Let me see if I can. Could you just click on this slide, I think. Yeah, that's it. Um, if you look to the rear, to the rear of the, if I point at the screen, it won't work. So I'm not going to get up. But if you look to the south, the the north of the development, you can see that area to the rear. There is a space. It is accessed from the side, and there is a small area of amenity space. It is small, but there is amenity space as part. How small is small? I haven't got a square metre for you, but well, you can see it. It it goes from the the one edge of the one side boundary to the other side boundary, completely to the rear. So you can see the building in the the dark plan, and you can see that that space up to the hedged boundary to the the north. That's the amenity space um, to the rear. But uh, as was indicated by the applicant's agent, it is in close proximity to, to parks and also to the wider open space that the, the city has. Um, in respect of the NHS, and this was a question that was raised last time, and I appreciate you weren't um, in attendance last time, Councillor Amos. Um, there are two contributions that the, the City Council tends to have. This is the second of them from the NHS. This is not for capital um, costs. This is for staffing costs. Um, it's been um, something that the South Worcestershire authorities have considered on numerous occasions, and particularly applications um, more recently for the urban extensions. They have resisted these type of extensions, these type of contributions, because it hasn't been demonstrated by the NHS that they can um, properly demonstrate that need. It's not as though they're looking for a doctor surgery extension. They're not looking at physical works. This is to prop up a failing um, fund generation for a very short gap, um, and it has not been demonstrated. Um, if you've got, I think, if Duncan wants to come in with any further detail, that might be helpful. Through you, Chair, just, just to add that um, I have a 
uh, a telephone call booked with a colleague at Malvern Hills District Council and the barrister that is acting on behalf of the three South Worcestershire councils in respect of the judicial review that has been lodged by the NHS Trust against uh, the council's decision on the South Worcestershire urban extension, the decision to grant outline planning permission to Welbeck strategic land. Um, the recommendation before you today on this application is consistent with decisions that this and the other two councils have made previously on this matter. And um, quite, quite simply, a decision to seek those Section 106 contributions today would risk undermining the council's position with regard to those very live legal proceedings. Basically, the acute trusts are arguing that there is a funding gap of 12 months because they are unable to um, predict and plan for service provision, as my colleague has just mentioned, not in respect of physical infrastructure, but in respect of uh, staff wages. Um, and their funding takes 12 months to catch up. But there was a recent uh, legal case in Leicestershire where the judge found against the trust and found that that was not necessarily the case and that matter was more complex than the trust were suggesting. Um, we can go into more detail today if necessary, but I hope that's helpful in informing you sufficiently to make a decision on this application today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll be brief on that point. Um, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase the question. I'm not so much concerned about the, um, the contributions. I'm concerned about what the NHS said in those two paragraphs I read out in terms of it can't cope now, and it certainly can't cope and, except to great detriment uh, if this development goes ahead. This development is what it's talking about. So can I ask the officers then, do they agree and accept what, with what the NHS has said in those two paragraphs about the unreasonable demand on the level of services that they cannot provide for this development? Do they agree with that, that statement in paragraph 7.106 and 7.107? Do they agree or not? Through you, Chair, no. Right, so the council's position, this official council position, is that what the NHS is saying about they can't cope with the demand is not true. They've got plenty of spare capacity to deal with 54 students who, as well as not having cars, they obviously don't have medical conditions as well. Through you, Chair, the situation is much more complex than the Trust would have us believe in terms of what they've written in their consultation response in terms of whether that funding gap exists or not, and whether their requirements, sorry, whether their requests, not requirements, whether their request complies with the community infrastructure levy uh, regulations in terms of what is legally uh, acceptable as a section 106 request. Thank you, Chair. We'll move on. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first, <laughs> Can I just clarify? I was, I, there was an implied criticism, I thought, of uh, perhaps the city council, or more generally perhaps the city, um, that we don't value the university. That is categorically untrue. The university has become an integral part of the city uh, and we value the contribution it makes. And that's as a as an academic facility, but also the supplementing of it, whether it's Worcester Wolves or or, or the Hive done in conjunction with the um, uh, 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 the county co and so it's disingenuous to suggest that we don't value the university. What we are concerned about, and we've always been concerned about, that on occasions student accommodation has been inappropriate. Now, you might blame us for that, where we've got uh, 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 houses multiple occupation in, in, in residential areas. Perhaps it should have been more robust there, but that has always been the concern. And in a, in a way, it's a concern now. But also at the moment, I think the, the overwhelming fear is, uh, as Councillor Amos has referred to, is, is around um, overspill parking. And, to put that into context, into context it, that predates this application. We know that. Um, unfortunately, other than for, through traffic or traffic 
visiting the supermarket, I'm afraid St. John's has become virtually out of bounds to all but the fleet of foot, which is, which is really sad. I don't know whether this is through design or, or accident. There was um, a reference to carbon, uh, carbon neutral, reducing carbon. Really, it suffered the worst of all worlds, having through traffic and an inability for people to visit because they can't find a parking space. And that's led to its decline. Yeah. And it's not a criticism, St. John's, because it's a place, place of, uh, well, I've grown up with. But it's led to a decline as a, a mini shopping center, but also as a social center. Yeah. And, and, and that's very sad. And that's not just for St. John's. We've talked about residents in this area. It's residents of Beberdine, ben, of wider St. John's, uh, of St. Clements, and beyond. Um, and, and, and that we, 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 we don't want to see get worse. Um, so I think it's reasonable, I think it's reasonable for us to have fears that there will be an overspill and that we could lose those few precious spaces we've got where people can park. Um, now, I, we've had some reassurances to be frank, I'm not reassured. Uh, we've had reassurances. I'm not assured that that won't happen. So my, my, my point is that just as we said, we value the university, but we're concerned about the accommodation. In this occasion, we, we're not, con in a way, not concerned, because we're concerned. We're, we're the, the focus of, of, of my attention isn't the accommodation. I think uh, students living within the heart of, of St. John's might well add to the vitality of the place and, and provide a, a customer base. I can see all that. The concern is for St. John's itself. If it becomes a people-free zone for the lack of anybody uh, uh, being able to park a car or whatever, then it will just continue in its decline, which I would find extremely sad. We've got Pat Agar. Thank you, Chair. I've revisited this application a few times before coming here, uh, and that's because I think it's a, the planning balance is a bit more subtle than I first thought. Um, first of all, we're talking about a heritage asset, albeit locally listed which will be completely destroyed. And we know from our planning policy framework, the national planning policy framework, and from case law, that that does constitute significant harm and shouldn't be done. So that's a consideration. It's pretty serious. The second is, from what I've heard today, I'm not terribly happy that the management plan is adequate given the sensitivity of the site. And I'm well aware that other sites with student accommodation are have been treated differently. Um, and yes, I was a student once myself, as many of us were. And I'm perfectly aware that medical students are just as raucous as any other student sometimes, uh, since my cousin was one once. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't repeat what, what happened at Liverpool Med School, but you know, it was lively, shall we say. I would be a lot happier if that management plan were properly staffed at night and not just a helpline. I would be happy if there was somebody on site because this is close to an assisted living facility which contains elderly and vulnerable people. And we really don't want them to, to, to suffer significant upset from this. I also think that when I look at the conditions on the construction controls, there isn't any detail there. We have fairly standard construction controls, but I would like to be sure uh, that, that uh, we had some detail on where all the construction vehicles were going to be parked up, how it was going to work, and that we, we really were quite strict on that. We did enforce it because I think that's going to be critical. Uh, in the construction phase. And the other thing is, on the plus side, I, I've been trying to work out whether I think it really will lead to fewer HMOs in the area and then less trouble otherwise than we might expect. So it, it's, I think it is a difficult balance. 
And I wonder if the tenancy agreements are going to be properly enforceable. So the, there's a lot there, and I'm, I'm still trying to weigh up what I think about the final balance. Um, through you, Chair, if I can just, just a couple of points, if I may, just for clarity. Um, Councillor Agar mentioned about the, the building itself. Just to, to clarify for members, it's not on the local list, so it's not a locally listed building. It's not on the national list. Um, what um, the conservation officer has said is that because of its age, because it's over 100 years old, it has some historical benefit, but it's not phrased in terms of the the NPPF in terms of being caught as a heritage asset in, in that respect. Um, and then in terms of the conditions, um, the conditions are a little bit more um, detailed than would normally be in terms of the construction environmental management plan. There is a little bit more in terms of requirement for um, a construction routing plan in terms of noise and disturbance and vibration. And yes, they are um, deferred for consideration by officers through conditions, but that is a normal process because once the contract has been let for the construction, that would be part of the construction um, from the construction team to be able to put that forward before they started any work. So until that contract is let, it's very difficult for the applicants to be able to say this is what the, that construction company would do, um, and that's why it's being conditioned. But um, uh, officers are happy to be, if members want, want, wish to tighten those up, they're happy to, to look at conditions with members if they so wish. I would be reassured by that, if that's okay, Chair. But I would also be much more reassured if in the management plan for the, uh, the building that there was overnight cover. And I would want that in the condition. I've got uh, Mel Alcos. Chair, yeah, thank you. Uh, just one comment and two very quick questions for highways, if I may. Um, obviously, last time I didn't want this application to be deferred. I didn't think it was best use of the planning committee, but obviously that was the decision I respected it and I've come back today. But to me, it doesn't feel as though that much has changed since the last committee. So that was my comment. And just a couple of questions, I think, for Karen, if I may. Uh, with the highways infrastructure um, and highways related requirements. It refers to a 65,000 financial contribution towards the provision of a zebra crossing. And I'm not an expert, but I know the cost of a pedestrian crossing was about 180,000 the last time I was quoted. So I was just wondering if you have the sums around a zebra crossing. And also um, in relation to the footpath, obviously you've got the cycle store and the cycles, but uh, my understanding is that the footpath is restricted to bicycles. Is that correct? or? or? You may not know that I... <laughs> thank you uh, first of all it's um i think as somebody pointed out apologies i can't rem remember um cyclists will have to dismount where the cycle parking is it, it is a footway it isn't it isn't a cycleway you're absolutely right there um contribution the, the contribution for the zebra crossing is a contribution it won't it won't um, be sufficient to provide um, a zebra crossing. It will be put together with other contributions that we've received um, to provide a zebra crossing. Apologies, I can't say to you, right, a zebra crossing is £97,000 or it's £105,000, but this acts as a contribution towards providing that. And uh, Marjorie Bissett. Thank you, Chair. I have a question which maybe I should have asked earlier on when we still had. Um, it, it's about the students who might live in this accommodation, is it a possibility that some of them might be disabled? And, and if so, um, might they need different methods of getting about um, other than a bicycle? Um, through you, Chair, um, yes, that has been anticipated. There is a condition proposed in terms of providing um, uh, rooms, accessible rooms within the development. Um, and as Karen has indicated um, as, as one of the, her responses, the provision is there for those who need it. Um, and that, that provision will be provided as part of a condition and can include sockets for e-bikes and such like. But ultimately we need to ensure that if there are fully provided that there are the requirement for 54 bikes, that that is provision is there. If it's not required because of whatever circumstances, 
that provision will always there, be there for the longevity of the, the development. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I, I think, um, I mean, I understand people's concerns, but I think, I think there could be, I, I, I think on balance, this development will bring needed vibrancy to the area. Um, I, I think it's not always good for people at, at different stages of their lives to live in ghettos and there can be some benefits from a more mixed community. Do I have any further contributions? Jenny. Thank you. Um, in no particular order, I don't think the hall is worth saving. It's falling down now. And I remember it last being used by the WI and it was only used occasionally. The odd children's party when people couldn't find anywhere else and it, it wasn't a very good space then and i don't think that it is very valuable that's my personal take on it uh I, on the nhs issue no i think there's a real big need for a walk-in center in worcester <laughs> so actually if there is money from the for the nhs to build a walk-in center then i'd be all for asking for that contribution 24 hours uh, i think we could do with um some kind of presence 24 hours so that if there is an issue locally then although 15 minutes sounds quite good then it could be nipped in the bud if somebody's actually on site at the time materials i think we discussed last time and i'd much prefer it to look the same sort of shades as the church rather than fairly mediocre um, social housing that's around it and i'm all for as Councillor lewing says using those spaces which won't be used most of the year for parking um, as car club and disabled spaces it could be that it's um, either or but i think they should be used it's, it's daft to have three spaces and not use them but it should be for something that benefits um, that community or actually the wider community. Now, car club could be used by some of the elderly people in the area as well. So I think there could be a good side benefit from that. And those are my main points. Thank you. I think, Alan, briefly, please. Yeah, just, just a question, and I, I, I may have missed it, but uh, in the so-called management plan, uh, for monitoring parking. Um, where does it say how often it will be done and by whom? Unless I'm, I may have missed it, because there are seven and a half pages of condition. Um, through you, Chair, the, the management plan um, is in draft and hasn't been agreed. What the condition requires is that that is submitted. So what officers were looking for was um, in terms of any feedback as part from this planning committee and it's something that members can feed into those requirements um, and it's something that can be um, insisted upon but that will need to be submitted and need to be ensured that that was in accordance with the planning committee's wishes in terms of what they expect a management plan to look like that is not for um, agreement now that is something that will have to be submitted as part of conditions but when when will that then come back to the committee mr sham because uh, members have expressed views but not a, a clear view on what they would expect from this management plan so when do we have input to tell the officers what we want then they know what to negotiate for um, it, it, uh, conditions in terms of submission they they're not for they don't come back to, to planning committee as um, members will probably um, be aware um if you look at condition seven, there are some bullet points in terms of what the requirements um, thus far we would expect to see within a management plan. I think the point I was trying to make, um, Councillor Amos, was that if members wish to add any other matters that they wanted the um, management, uh, management plan to, to cover, it is something that members could add to that bulleted point and that would then cover off the committee's wishes in terms of what they wanted to see as part of the management plan. I think Mr Chairman, it actually ironically raises a rather important issue 
that we are being asked to agree something and we don't know what's going to be in the central condition that members have expressed a view on unless they they tell an officer that this yeah. could include them in negotiations oh. it's a stitch up isn't it no oh, just one sec if, if we move to specific conditionality additions yeah then i think we're, there, there is a, a route forward if we simply you know have a, a much broader conversation then we're we're, we're essentially we're, we're not leading anywhere are we what i would invite members if you are if they're and uh, councillor agar and councillor barnes have already alluded to a couple of things that, that i'm sure they would uh, would like to uh, uh, add as sort of conditionality any other members please please for, use this opportunity now to make those points clear uh, but you know we are with all due respect to 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 particularly to councillor amos we need to get that in a focused way i'm not suggesting for one second, Alan, that you're, you're lacking focus, but yeah, Alan, uh, Pat. Yes, I, I very much would like to see a condition in the management plan uh, for overnight cover from 11 till 7, partly uh, for the security of nearby residents, but for the security, I think, of the residents of the block themselves, because such a person would get to know them. They would, they, you know, they, they, it, it would help with the overall ethos of the building a great deal, I think. Uh, and it would circumvent, I think it would largely circumvent any problems arising. Um, if, if the committee would agree with that. Is that something that, that members generally would feel supportive of? <laughs> Councillor Ditter. with the security industry authority not just a steward so he can act on whatever he deems necessary any further points I want to raise particularly around the, the idea of conditionality here Paul. Um, through you chair and um, just to pick up on some of the comments that have raised and just to, to clarify um, in terms of, um, there was some comments in terms of spaces being used for car club and disabled. Um, members may wish to include that as a condition because that's not covered at present. Um, and I think I mentioned in terms of um, sockets for e-bikes, just to make sure that the cycle provision provides that as well in terms of the conditions. Okay, I'm, I'm going to look back at this point. It's just a question, Chairman, because a lot of comments have been made about the car parking enforcement and not in allowing potential tenants to have car park, have bring cars to the university or to the residential accommodation. A very simple qu question is how will the um, owners of this of the site be able to identify whether the cars parked in the area are student or otherwise? Yeah. How will they be able to serve a, a, an eviction notice or a, a penalty notice on a tenant? How will they identify a car is parked in the area as a student car? Uh, it's impossible as far as I can see, but I'd be, I'd be very useful to know how that can happen. Thank you, Chair. Um, the reason that we drew your attention earlier to condition number seven is that there are a series of bullet points within the drafting of that condition which explain to you what that management plan would be expected to include if permission were granted today and uh, the applicant were to discharge that condition. I think, um, I think the best way to terms of what the lease agreement might say is that this is the applicant trying to offer to you something which gives some reassurance and it is where they would use their reasonable endeavours to try and re avoid or reduce students bringing cars to the site. So the word I would use is deterrent. The wording within that lease agreement, we want that to act as a deterrent. Is it going to stop every student? bringing a car to the site or to Worcester? Probably not, that's the reality. And then we, you need to, to decide what weight you're going to give that in your consideration this afternoon. So um, notwithstanding everything that you heard from the agent and the applicant today, 
the reality could well be that the enforceability of this matter falls to the City Council because, um, as was picked up earlier, um, a student could give a registration number for a vehicle which they happen to be brought to the site at the beginning of a, uh, an academic year which is not the same registration number as a vehicle that they go on to buy two months later and then use in the city. But there are so many different scenarios exactly. that might occur exactly. that it is difficult for you as a planning committee to envisage all of those. Yeah. And it is difficult for the applicant uh, to um, come up with a lease agreement that covers those yeah. as well. Exactly. So my point being, my point being that the condition tries to act as a deterrent and sit alongside and complement the lease agreement, but that may only go so far. Um, you have the advice of the Highway Authority in terms of their consideration of the application as a statutory consultee, and then you have all of those other considerations that you've been debating this afternoon. So um, I think where you, forgive me, but I think where you find yourselves this afternoon is having to decide, do you want to grant planning permission for the development with conditions that are as robust as they possibly can be, but cannot guarantee that students won't have cars and bring them to the city, but park them outside of that uh, one kilometre uh, zone? Or, or are you envisaging that the assurances that you've seen, read about, are not sufficient, and therefore the development would result in a significant increase in parking in the area that would be detrimental to the character and appearance of the area and the residential amenity of those that currently live in that area and enjoy it as it is currently. Um, I think when you're weighing those things up, you probably also just need to put yourself in, in the mind or in the shoes of a planning inspector that if there were to be an appeal following a refusal, how might an inspector view this in light of all of that, plus the advice from the highway authority? Um, would they come to the same conclusion that you're coming to one way or the other? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, sorry, yeah, Pat, forgive me. Sorry, I, I, I wanted to just follow up on, on Paul Round's um, comments about the construction plan. I mean, would the committee trust the chair and I to make sure that that worked, or, or rather that it was tight enough? Because we can, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I'd be happy to trust both of you, but uh, as, Mr., as Mr. Rush will tell you, we can agree anything here, but when it comes to enforcement, and I'm only thinking of University Park Drive, where actually we have no powers of enforcement of anything. You've got lorries parked all over the place, mud on the road, stones, obstruction, blockages. It goes on willy-nilly. We don't have any powers. So, Mr Chairman, we've got to be serious about conditions we're imposing if they're not enforceable. I've always been trained that we shouldn't be imposing conditions that are not enforceable. Now we're imposing conditions that we know are not enforceable. Yeah, uh, got Karen Lewin. Can I suggest uh, another um, condition? In that case, that the contractor should be part of the considerate contractors scheme so that they get a performance score every month on how they are performing. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Disick, yes. What about the, the security guard being between 11 pm to 7 am, who was secure, SIA registered? Okay, thank you. And Richard, yeah. for, just for clarity, Chair, the answer to my question, which I made earlier, mm. uh, there is no observation or ability for anybody to observe the ownership of a vehicle on the highway, so it's completely unenforceable to say that we will uh, not be able to bring cars to this site, because nobody will know whose car ownership it is. The legal officer, because Councillor Udall has made a very valid point that when I've been making, which is that we should not be imposing conditions which are not enforceable. Equally, if you don't impose that condition, then this whole scheme shouldn't go ahead anyway. The applicant has chosen 
to put in his tenancy agreement that they're not going to require students to part within a mile of the site. That, that's what the applicant is putting in his tenancy agreement. It's for the applicant to manage that process. For the, as Duncan has already stated, quite clearly regarding parking and car and not being able to bring cars to the bank, you need to take on board the comments of the highway authority as a statutory consultee and their views and their comments on, on that they accept that this development is acceptable on highway matters. Um, through you, Chair, obviously members, um, we haven't got a motion on the table at this present moment in time. When we do so, um, it will be a matter that I can come back in at that point and just clarify as part of any motion, um, if it is for accepting the recommendation, to wrap up those conditions that have been mentioned. And I can, I can do that so that there is some clarity in what um, the, the motion is. But at the moment, I can't clarify that because there's no motion on the table. OK, thank you. The question then, then is, this or what? Do members have alternative proposals above and beyond the conditionality? Well, John, I'm happy to move to get the thing moving. Is we refuse for the reasons that Mr. Rudge gave very neatly when he gave us the two options. I can't remember the exact words, but it will be recorded about the the, the um, excessive disruption, lack of parking provision, and the consequences thereof. It was that the second option that Mr. Rudge gave us. Uh, a few minutes back. That, that's the basis on which I would move refusal for this application. Duncan. Thank you, Chair. Um, this would need some uh, fine tuning, um, but something along the lines of notwithstanding what the applicant has put forward regarding a car and parking management strategy, um, that this is insufficient and that the development would lead to a significant increase in the parking of motor vehicles on the surrounding local roads that would have a harmful impact on the character, appearance and amenity of the area. Um, as I say, you know, that, that's a quick draft this afternoon whilst I've been listening to your debate. Um, but hopefully that, that's sufficient. Thank you, Chair. I think what Duncan has, uh, has articulated may or may not be the spirit of the, the table. Uh, Alan, I suspect, will uh, concur with the, the general point there. Um, so is there anyone who would be willing to second that? No. Councillor Ditto is willing to second that. Yeah. In which case then we... Yeah, George, if you would, please, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, therefore, the motion in front of you, Chair, is for refusal contrary to the recommendation of officers. Um, the Planning Committee resolved to refuse the Planning Commission on the ground detailed previously by Mr Rudge and delegates authority to the Corporate Director of Planning and Governance, subject to consultation with the Chair and Vice-Chair of the Planning Committee, to confirm the final wording of the above ground and issue the decision notice. All those in favour of refusal on that ground? That's two. All those against refusal on that ground? One, two, one, two three, four, five, six. And any abstentions? Two. So that motion has not carried. And therefore, would ask uh, members if we have another motion, please. Uh, I'd like to move um, acceptance of this proposal. Um, thank you, members. Just to, to clarify, in terms of the points that were raised as part of the discussion, and for Councillor Bissett to, to pick up as part of the the, the movement. Um, so in terms of condition seven, there's an additional bullet point which members wish to see, which was to detail overnight cover between five and nine on site, which should include a security guard with the, rec the necessary qualifications. 
Um, there was also an addition to the condition on cycle, cycle parking in terms of a socket for e-bikes. There was a condition in terms of the, the car parking spaces once vacated for arrival and departure will be used for car club and disabled um, spaces. Um, and that the construction um, environmental management plan and such like will include the consider considerate contractors scheme. Thank you, Councillor Lillian, for helping me with that. Um, and uh, that any agreement on that should be agreed through the chair and vice chair. So, Councillor Bissett has moved it, and uh, Councillor Agar has, has seconded. Councillor Barnes? Um, I wanted the condition in about materials, changing the colours of the materials to fit in with the church. And also, um, sorry, also um, on the NHS funding, which was page 39, is it? I, I still believe that we should be making contribution towards the NHS, but uh, I'm willing to debate that on the basis that all our NHS is completely overwhelmed at the moment and we need a new walk-in centre. So if it would help towards that, so much the better. Did you want to clear that up? Um, through you, Chair, um, in terms of the, the materials, there is a materials condition on there, but um, I'm happy to add an additional note in terms of the committee's wishes in terms of looking at that different palette of materials. In terms of the NHS, um, the, as... as um, Duncan has already indicated, we have had no um, request for, con uh, for contributions in terms of capital costs. There are two different arms to the NHS. There has been no request for capital costs as part of this development, and therefore it's not required. Thank you. So we have a mover and a seconder for the uh, recommendation towards you. Would you just like to read that out just before, we, just for clarity? Yes, thank you. Through you, Chair. So it's um, for approval in accordance with the officer's recommendation as set out in the report. So that's subject to the section 106 agreement, the recommending conditions set out in the report and the additional conditions that have just been referred to by Mr. Rand. All those in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six. Those against? One, and abstentions? Three. The no, permission. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, three abstentions and, and yourself. I've already read. Yeah. I'm sorry, I've already done the. Oh, yeah, the one yes, no, yes, no. yes, yes. I've done. No, no, no. There was an abstention down here. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the so the the application is approved. Abstentions are funny things, they can have power. I don't normally abstain, but um, I, I, I am abstaining because I know the business plan or the management plans to be developed. Um, had I seen the management plan having been developed, then I may have voted one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, if anyone else wishes to use the uh, facilities, then do so.
Okay. Um, welcome back, everyone. Can we move to uh, agenda item nine? Um, uh, 4244 Barbon Road. Um, so when you're all ready, uh, I'll pass to uh, Paul. Okay. Just wait for the, uh, the PowerPoint to uh, catch up. Just, I've got this in the wrong order, members, so uh, I do apologise. We're just going to have to flash back to, through the uh, Slides backwards. I'm not asking. I'm not going to read my uh, presentation backwards, so don't worry. Um, okay. So, um, as chair has indicated, um, members took the opportunity of a site visit earlier on today, um, and if we can book this sunshine for every site visit, I'm sure we can uh, try and encourage more members to to come out on the site visit. So this application relates to two guest houses located on Barbourn Road to the north of the city centre. The properties lie to the south of St George's Lane South and is surrounded by residential properties on Shrubbery Avenue, Barbourn Road and St George's Square, with Thornlow House lying opposite the, the property. The site does lie within the Shrubbery Avenue conservation area with the Grade 2 listed buildings in the vicinity. And the greater listed buildings are shown in red there and are listed within the report. The properties themselves, they are not statutory listed um, and they are not locally listed. Some photos of the site. Um, this is an aerial photo and you can see the properties in St George's Square and then the properties, the application properties are on the corner of Barbourne Road and St George's, um, St George's Road North. Sorry, St George's Lane South, let me get that right. Um, that's looking back towards Barbourne Road. And you can see the rear of the properties to the left-hand side. This property is looking from opposite and we've got four pictures. So we have the, the top left-hand one is properties to the front. Um, the top right-hand one is to the rear and again to the front. And then those are the existing garages which are accessed from St George's Lane South. Um, this is within the site and you can see the rear uh, projection um, and also the neighbours rear projection there. Um, and you can see the courtyard area and the middle picture shows the flat roof um, existing rear extension. So some pictures for context that the applicants has provided as part of the application and just provides a wider context than the officer photos. Um, and again, just the aerial photo showing the extent of the site and how that the property goes hard up to the adjacent road. Planning permission is sought for the conversion and extension of the guest houses to create 10 one bed flats and two three bed flats, providing a total of three uh, total of 12 flats. The conversion of the existing properties to additional residential dwellings is supported by local and national policies which seek to increase the number of new dwellings, subject to the detailed applications of the application. Policy SWDP 14 provides a requirement for any new schemes, including conversions, to provide a mix of accommodation. This application provides a suitable mix of both one-bed properties and also family-based accommodation for three bed properties and therefore the proposal is acceptable in principle. The, the scheme has to be designed to provide a shared rear courtyard along with a grassed area. The condition is proposed for a full landscaping scheme to ensure the quality of the space provided for residents. The existing garage will be altered to provide an enclosed bin store with a cycle storage adjacent. The existing rear projections will be altered and increased in height. Both will be provided with pitched roofs appropriate to the building and the surrounding properties and will unify the, the, the position, sorry, and will unify the appearance of the dwellings as a pair. The design of the extensions is considered acceptable. And that's just a picture of the rear and also to the front, just to show that there's no alterations to the rear property. The adjacent dwellings are some distance away from the application site and as such there is no direct overlooking into dwellings that will occur. The additional story to the rear will, will create an additional window towards the neighbouring property. 
towards the neighbouring garden. However, this will not result in any increased loss of amenity, being the same distance as the second floor windows, both on 44 and 46 Barbourne Road. And you can see that from the aerial photo. The proposed accommodation is laid out across three floors, each of which um, of the units meet the nationally described space standards. And so these are the floor plans. So on the ground floor, we have the three bedroom properties, which utilize the basement area. And then we have one bed properties to the rear of the ground floor. And then we have one bed properties, both on the first floor and the second floor plan. The site is located within heritage location, being in the conservation area and close to listed buildings. The responses received from the heritage consultees confirm that the proposals will have a neutral impact on heritage assets. The proposals would provide a viable use within the conservation area and would preserve and enhance its character and its appearance. The proposal sets out that the development will provide no car parking on site. This is supported by the Highway Authority, who consider the location to be sustainable in close proximity to services and shops, along with being located directly on the main bus route and in walking distance from the train station. Cycle parking for each property is provided within the courtyard. Concerns have been raised as part of the consultation process that there are no off-street uh, off car parking spaces as part of the proposal, and that this will impact on the residents' parking scheme and putting undue pressure on the, that existing permitting scheme. When considering the comparable com parking demands, it's noted that the 20 bed guest house had a parking requirement for 20 spaces. This was met with three spaces on site and then a shortfall of 17 spaces, which would be required to be off street on surrounding streets. In comparison, the proposed use for 12 units would generate a theoretical need for 14 car parking spaces. These are provided all off on street. And so therefore there is a net decrease from the, the amount of on street spaces which were provided as part of the guest house. And this exercise does demonstrate that there wouldn't be any additional car, park, car parking demand against the backdrop of the existing use. It will be noted that the Highway Authority have confirmed the position in respect of parking permits, noting that the circumstances of this case and in comparison with the surrounding permitting scheme would mean that the properties would only be eligible for a total of six permits, which is in ex exactly the same as the current situation. Overall, there is considered that there is no additional parking demand taking account of the sustainable location in which the development sits the existing use and that therefore the application is considered to be wholly acceptable in highway terms. A construction environmental management plan is recommended as a condition and you'll see that on the late papers members to cover all construction elements and can be expanded if members so wish to cover other matters such as scaffolding positions. Any positioning of skips or scaffolding within the highway would require a separate license through the highway authority. The applicants have provided a, an ecology assessment, which concludes that additional work is required for bats prior to any works commencing on the roof within the roof space. And a condition is proposed to ensure that this is provided, along with mitigation and a scheme for a biodiversity enhancement. This scheme will cover both landscaping and ecology enhancements. On this basis, the scheme fulfills the requirements as part of the development plan. Due to the number of units proposed, the applicants have agreed to enter into a section 106 agreement to secure contributions toward public open space as set out within the draft heads of terms in appendix one of the report. In summary, the proposal for the reuse of the existing building is considered to be acceptable, providing new dwellings in a sustainable location with minimal impact on surrounding residential properties and preserving and enhancing the conservation area. All detailed matters have been fully considered in detail and found acceptable. The application is therefore recommended for delegated approval, subject to the signing of a section 106 agreement and the conditions set out within the report and on the late paper. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay, uh, happy to uh, welcome to today's meeting, Tom Neal, who's obviously joined at the table at the top by Jill Sarah, and they will speak uh, as objectors. They have the usual time limit that, and I'm sure they're aware that George will um, 
give them an indication of when that time is running out. You're free to use the time as you wish. So when you're ready, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm Tom Neal from St George's Square, speaking on behalf of the Residents Association, which has also submitted a formal written objection. I don't have time to go through the planner's report in detail, but I would like to draw your attention to the fact that one important registered objection is not mentioned. It points out that in the applicant's planning statement, submitted only on the 22nd of March, the flats are described as highly beneficial to couples, not families, but couples. I'll come back to this as I attempt to summarize our objections. Overdevelopment, design and amenity. This is clearly overdevelopment of two important gateway buildings situated on a main entrance road to Worcester. The flats are tiny. They meet the national space standard of 39 square meters for single occupancy, but the standard for one bedroom units with two occupants, e.g. a couple, is 50 square meters. So the eight flats, which are under 50 square meters, do not meet the standard. Now I know the committee approved an application last month, 24A Barbon Road, with one flat that was too small, but eight. I think Worcester deserves better than that. Furthermore, the two three bedroom flats, which add to the housing mix, each include two bedrooms in the cellar with no natural light or ventilation. In addition, if each were occupied by three unrelated people, they would both be HMOs by stealth without an HMO license. Indeed, the whole development is practically an HMO. The outside amenity space is tiny with high boundary walls. The internal living environment of these flats will be poor. The detrimental impact on the amenity of the neighborhood with its nearby heritage assets is considerable. The properties are in one conservation area and adjoin another which contains a number of listed buildings. Occupation of 12 flats on a permanent basis is often going to create more people living in more crowded conditions on a long-term basis than the existing bed and breakfasts, which potent with potential detrimental impacts on the neighborhood. The design seems to be based on how many flats can we create, not how can we satisfy the requirements of high quality design. Adding an additional story to the existing rear extensions creates a significant increase in the density of the proposed development. The idea that this somehow improves the building seems very odd. The scale and massing is considerable and creates an overbearing brick flank wall on the north side of number 44. The overlooking of the two kitchens in the two flats, they overlook each other, in the th new third story via the dormer windows is not conducive to acceptable living standards. Parking and bins. I'm afraid parking is another issue. I know you've just discussed that. The reduction of parking spaces from the existing three to none, when 14 should be provided in accord with the streetscape design guide, is somehow justified by designating this development as parking free. But if the city centre location means no parking is required, why is it proposed that six parking permits should be available, which would also give access to 640 days of visitor parking per year? The existing control parking zone is already over full and the applicant has not committed to ensure that tenants leases exclude access to permits, as was the case in the previous application you just looked at, or asked that the properties be excluded from the controlled zone. The overdevelopment, worsened by the additional story to be added, requires a bin store big enough for 24 waste bins. This is why the amenity space next to the bins is so small. But the real problem is that 12 of these will have to be put out in St George's Lane South for collection every Thursday, with no commitment by the applicant to provide a comprehensive concierge service to deal with them, the single track lane with no pavement risks being blocked every week by bins. This in turn creates potential risks in the case of fire, with fire engines being unable to access the lane. And of course, there's no room for external fire escapes from the additional rear stories because the open area at the back is so small. In conclusion, there are many grounds for refusing this application, ranging from overdevelopment, design and amenity issues, to parking and waste bin issues. On behalf of the St George's Square Residents Association, I ask you, the planning committee, to reject this application. Thank you.
This application should be refused for all of the reasons just given and because the plan for the top floor is untenable. A local architect tells us that the scaffolding needed would unavoidably reduce the width of the lane and make bin collection impossible for this side of the square for months. Finally, this committee knows when it sees an H&O by cell. Please refuse it. Okay, thank you both. Um, questions uh, from members, please. Andy. Not, a, not a question to you, if you excuse me, but when, when I come back to, to the offices, I, I'm looking specifically at uh, paragraph 810, which says that uh, the layouts have been uh, carried, have been revised in conjunction with offices. So um, thank you very much for your contribution. I've taken note of that. And can I come to the officer later and, and get clarification on that? Uh, return to your seats. I'd be grateful. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's no, if you, good. Thank you. Yeah, if you could, please. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, so um, wider floor questions, please. Alan. <clears throat> Thanks, Joe. Just a few questions first. <clears throat> um, can highways and or the city council define what is the city centre? Because according to their definitions, Henwick Road is in the city centre and Barbourne Road is in the city centre. So perhaps it's easier. Can you tell me what's not in the city centre? That's the first question. I'm not sure I can answer that question, um, uh, Councillor Amos, but obviously this site is very close to, you know, and I know it's going to upset you when I say that it's in a sustainable location, but obviously this site is so close to um, easy walking distance to uh, the railway station, to f many facilities, it's on a main bus route, so it is in, it, it might not be in the core centre centre, but it is in the city centre, it, it's part of the city centre. I'm sure Paul can answer it much better than I can. Um, from, from my perspective, from a planning perspective, there is the, the core business district, which is, tends to look at where you look at shops and services. But there is the wider city, which um, this is part of. So, yes, I do consider it as part of the city centre and it's part of that wider picture. Not on this occasion, but Mr. Round can send me a map, his map which is the city centre, and then I'll bring it to the next meeting to, because everything is city centre. And I, perhaps, perhaps where I live is city centre as well. I mean, it's a 25 minute walk, but that's presumably city centre. Okay, it's fine, okay. The truth, Mr. Chairman, is nobody really knows what the city centre is, but, 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 for, but for planning purposes, everything is a city centre, because then you can have parking free, car, car free development. Um, I mean, highways used to be a department which tried to deal with congestion. Now it seems that highways is a department that's actually wanting congestion because it's putting, uh, of supporting development, knowing that people will have cars. And I say cars are these things that don't disappear. They've got to be parked somewhere. So I've got some, uh, some questions on, on other related matters. Um, they talk about, started talking about 13 self-contained one bedrooms. All right, we understand that. That's 13 bedrooms, that's 26 people. Um, we've now got 10 one bed and two three bed. That's 16 beds, isn't it? Um, and depending on the configuration of the two three beds, you're, you're, that, that could be uh, 30 people, give or take. Um, we're told that in those two three beds, there's no natural light. Well, Mr Chairman, I'm sure we haven't stooped to such a, 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 a level where we're going to approve rooms which have no natural light. Surely, you know, Victorians did that, but surely we're in the New Carolingian era now. Um, and also, uh, my concern is, again, the configuration, and perhaps Mr. Round could confirm my suspicions, although he'll try and deny them, but perhaps he can confirm my suspicions, that actually these two, three beds really are HMOs, aren't they? HMOs. And what this application is, in essence, 
It's a staging post to an HMO. That's what this is. So you've got all the one beds, shove in a couple of three beds to say it's mixed development. And then it won't be before long. Oh, but they want to convert these three beds into singles and it's all for an HMO. So this is what we're talking about. Now, again, I suppose we're going to be told people in HMOs don't have cars either. For some reason, this uniqueness of Worcester fascinates me because we have people moving into Henwick Road, Barbourne and all the city centre, which is basically the whole city as far as I can see. But none of them have cars. They just get on bikes. Um, I mean, I would have gone on the site visit this morning, Mr. Chairman, but there was no safe cycle story. So I decided not to risk my bike. So I didn't go this morning. But seriously, Mr. Chairman, you talk about bus lanes, you know, and, and bus routes. They stop around about six o'clock in the evening. So where are you going to go in the evening and how are you going to go at weekends? The truth of the matter is people may not use cars for their job, but they will have them so they can go do their weekly shop at the weekend. I know Miss Tangent goes to, to Waitrose, but she doesn't do it on the bike. She does it in a car and other people, you know, go out for leisure and other, other facilities. So I, I'm just pointing out the inconsistency of all this. Um, and of course, as Mr. Neil said, Mr. Chairman, and I think this has got to be taken into account. You're, you're, yeah, well, the, the other, there's a couple of questions in there, but the final question is, has, has it been taken into account? You're talking about, you know, bed and breakfast, which come and go, as opposed to residential, which is permanent, you know, and I have asked the question about, is it true that there are rooms with no natural light? Is it true that we're talking about 30, 30 odd people? And would Ms. Hanshit just remind me of the bus services that are available after six o'clock um, and at weekends? Um, through you, Chair, um, in terms of the, the basement areas, there is light wells to them. Um, it's not um, perfect in terms of the, the natural light, but they do provide a mix of accommodations. The ground floor provides adequate natural light because of the, the bay windows. In terms of the HMO by stealth, I think was the, the comment that was made. Um, as all members know there is an Article 4 direction across this city which prevents um, properties being used as a, a HMO without planning permission. Planning permission would be required and it would be a matter for the City Council to consider any application. We haven't got a HMO, we've got an application for flats. So in terms of by stealth, that would be a matter for planning enforcement, which would happily be able to, to, to um, require that to be submitted. And if unacceptable, it would be enforced against. So um, in terms of those matters, in terms of buses, I'll have to defer to, to Karen in terms of that. You just confirm, did you say there were rooms with no natural light, yes or no? To, to clarify, within the basement area, to be specific for members, the, the master bedrooms do not have natural light, but the bedrooms too are served by light wells. I'm just going to tell me about the bus services. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, you are correct, Councillor Amos. Uh, many of the bus services in Wentworth Worcester do finish at six o'clock in the evening. The 144 service that passes this site uh, runs in the evening. It also runs on Saturday and Sunday. And I was pleased to see it even running on Easter Sunday with lots of uh, people on the bus. Um, in terms of parking, I'm not sure that I can add anything to what Mr. Round put in his um, presentation because he explained um, the circumstances here where obviously there is a fallback position. The 20 bed B&B &B had a requirement for 20 parking spaces. There were three spaces on site. So, you know, it was short by 17 spaces. So essentially this proposal is only short by 14 spaces so well we have to it, it, this is this is planning and if we went to, if we refuse this um the applicant would obviously refer to the fact that the fallback position is there fallback position that could be brought back into use and you know we, we would lose so that is why we have not objected and i think um mr round went into detail as well with the um residence parking scheme that the situation would be would remain as it is at the moment they currently have access to six permits they will only have access to six permits once this development takes place should members approve it today any further comment um from members councillor alcott and then councillor visit yeah, just a quick question for clarity um part obviously prior to this with the bed and breakfast accommodation i guess was it were they always full and did they have i think was it 
how many occupants did Karen say? I just wanted to get it into context, how many people we did have there and how many we will have. Through you, Chair, in terms of a fallback position, it's not how that the existing properties were used, it's what the potential use could be. And so what, in terms of a fallback position, you have to look at the worst case scenario, and that's the way from a planning perspective, it was a bed and breakfast for up to, for 20 bedrooms. So there was 20 bedrooms, and that is the fallback position. Thank you. Audrey. Um, I, I just wanted to raise a point about the, um, the space standards. Um, we've been told that the, the one bed flats um, comply with these with the space requirements but um the gentleman from the St. george's square residence association mentioned that there was nothing to stop um one of these one bedroom flats being occupied by two people um so is can we put something in the condition in which case that they would not meet the requirements for space so can we condition that that these are one person one bedroom flats I'm, and I'm also very concerned about the lack of um, uh, natural light and ventilation on in the basement. Um, through you, Chairman, um, from my professional view is that we couldn't condition the number of people within the, the, the rooms. However, the space standards are such that they are designed that they would, and I think it's probably a phrase that uh, Duncan used before, would discourage because the space standards are based on one bed, one person flats, and that's the space that you get. If you're looking at one person, two, sorry, one, one bed, two person, you're then looking up to the 50. If somebody chose to occupy it, but from a planning perspective, what we are providing is one person, one bed flats. Now, if somebody wishes to, to put one, two, three people in there, that is a choice they make in terms of the accommodation. What we are making sure is that what is proposed, we are making sure that those space standards are sufficient. So when we're looking at a one bed, one person, we're not going down to 20 square metres, or if it's claimed to be a two person, we're not going down to 45 square metres. So it's making sure that those, those elements are, but it's certainly something that we couldn't condition. Thank you, Chair. Just, just to add, um, it, it may be helpful to think of this situation a little bit like um, a more conventional um, two-storey uh, family house that might be three or four bedroom and whether a family chooses to put bunk beds in a children's bedroom, for example, may not be the, the best example, but um, that's an example of where, from a planning perspective, we don't have ultimate control over the level of occupancy. Now, whether you like that analogy or not, um, I think the reason I mention it is that we have to apply um, planning judgment and all importantly, consider each application on its merits. So it's really important that we look at the floor plans for this application specifically, um, whether it's the, the basement where we're looking at the master bedroom to the front of the properties underneath the bay windows um, that some of you will have seen on the site visit earlier today that don't have any direct natural light um, compared to the bedrooms at the back within the basement the one is utilizing an existing uh, light well the other one is creating a light well from an existing doorway um, and using our planning judgment to decide whether we think that would provide a reasonable standard of residential accommodation. Similarly, um, going back to the space standards, looking at the upper floors and deciding whether we reasonably think they would be occupied on a one person or two person basis, and then deciding whether we're comfortable with the lower space standard for a one bedroom, one person flat, or we require and are prepared to refuse planning permission because we want to see the higher 50 square meter floor area for a one bed flat. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. This question has been asked. Thank you. Then can I get that clarification? As, can I say, as I understand it, paragraph 810, means that uh, our officers have looked at uh, a proposal that was probably not satisfactory and have um, advised on the mix 
of two, three, and um, one bedroom flats. And and I'm grateful that they've they've said that it's in their professional view it's uh, limited to moderate positive weight. I think that that's helpful because that 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 helps with a, a decision. I think, but it doesn't direct us as it were. It, it, it's more helpful than that. So, am I am I understanding that paragraph correctly? And then the other thing. Um, we've had this before, I know. Um, the building regulations, I know, uh, are outside planning, uh, but uh, we are not through a planning approval, are we, saying anything that would lead to a, a contravention of building regulation standards? Um, through you, Chair, in terms of paragraph um, 8, 10, downwards um you're absolutely correct councillor roberts um the original submission was for 13 one bed flats the 13th flat um and unlucky for some was down in the basement with apps with just those light sources and for the complete accommodation to be down there officers felt that was unacceptable in terms of light and also in terms of the policy that we mentioned as part of the presentation we needed a mix so what we have as a as a proposal before you is that there is a, a split of the accommodation so the the bedrooms are downstairs where light is not quite so necessary and the the living room and the day space if you want to put it like that is there served by all the natural light um, in terms of your your second question in terms of building regulations i can't cover off every single one of the building regulations but i noticed that the objector talked about fire escapes um, within the floor plans, it does show um, the stairwells are to be fire protected um, and they've already started to think about what would be required from building regulations. There is nothing that highlights to me that there would cause any difficulties, but obviously that, as you quite rightly said, is a separate matter, which is not for us today, but they certainly have started to think that about fire protected corridors. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And um, we were just take take. Uh, oh, thank you, Chair. We we're just taking a moment. We we've um, spotted an anomaly between uh, one of the elevation and uh, cross section drawings compared to the floor plan, and we're just trying to make sense of that. But if you could just be, could just bear with us, we'd be grateful. Thank you.
Thank you, Chairman. Um, very helpfully, I, I failed to include the cross-section which was on the presentation, so apologies, members. There is a cross-section that um, does show that the as part of the proposal, there will be excavation to the front to ensure that there will be windows to those master bedrooms in the basement. So the master bedrooms will be provided with an additional bay window which will continue downwards to provide light into the master bedrooms. And then the bedroom two will be provided by the light wells that have already been described. So master bedrooms will be provided with light along with the um, basement, the bedroom number two. Something, yes? Chair, if it would be helpful, um, it wouldn't be a problem at all. For, for any member that would want to see this on screen, I could bring the laptop round just to inform your, your discussion. I appreciate this is only dealing with one of a number of points that you've, that you've uh, been discussing this afternoon, but I think it's important to be completely crystal clear about what is proposed. It's unhelpful uh, that the floor plan isn't entirely consistent with the cross-section. Sorry, can I just make a point though that a light well does not provide a view and I'd like members to consider that without a window to look out on when you wake up in the morning, how is that actually going to affect your mental health? Thank you very much. So, yes, Karen Lewin, please. Yeah, so um, I was asking a question about the windows and the angle, and, and what I was thinking about was, because I'm not happy with windowless accommodation for, for housing at all. I think it's virtually inhumane and it's a moral issue. 
But when you look at that window, is it the equivalent of like a basement flat in London? Is it that kind of thing? Is that what we're looking at? I don't, you know, is there, a, is this kind of accommodation acceptable in other places? I don't know. Um, through you, Chair, um, yes, that type of thing. But again, that is something that is found in other cities, not just London, in, in any urban environment where there are basement um, accommodation, it is that type of accommodation that you're referring to. Thank you very much. Alan Amos. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, I'm very pleased to hear there is some natural light seeping in. But of course, the, the view is a black, is a, is a brick wall. Um, so I think Councillor Lewing is making a fair point. I mean, you might have some natural light, but the, you're looking at a brick wall. And can I, could I just invite the committee and yourself, Chair, in your esteemed position? I mean, we are approving this kind of accommodation in the 21st century. Is this a sort of accommodation we should be providing? Um, because if you look at standards in the past, they've always improved. We now, in the last year or so, we seem to have been going backwards. We're going smaller, shoving in as many as you can get, no amenity space, um, no parking, no, no nothing. Um, and I'm just very concerned the route we're going down. I mean, historically, uh, a lot of damage has been done to our wonderful city by knocking things down and taking no account of history. We now seem to be going hell for leather to shove in as many substandard units as we can. And I think it's a great shame. And I think we need to be aware of the consequences of what we're doing, because I don't think we are. Through you, Chair, just reiterate a comment that I've made previously in terms of that the living space is on the ground floor, which will have the main windows will have the main views. It is only the bedroom accommodation, which is down in the basement. Um, and that has been demonstrated and shown that that has natural light provided to it. Any further comment around the question of light, but also the, the broader uh, application itself? Alan. Sorry, yeah, I should have asked earlier. Um, uh, one of the objectors uh, talking about no outside amenity space. Could, can Mr. Round clarify that, unless I need a magnifying glass to see where it is again? No outside amenity space? Um, through you, through you, Chairman, um, the, there is amenity space. Um, as members will have seen on the, the layout plan, it's a shared courtyard. There is a small amount of, of green space, but again, it is in close proximity to, to local parks. C can Mr. Round define small, Mr. Chairman, please, again? Getting confused by these definitions, small. Um, I don't know whether we can pull it up on the screen. It is on page 68. It's on page 68. Yeah. Page 68. Right. And well, you've got to give me the answer, Mr. Round, before I get to page 68. I haven't got the, the size um, oh. in terms of the. You said small, so So you have um, to the to the rear of the properties, you have the shared courtyard, and then you have the green area of space, which is a grassed area. Um, and as you'll see within the report and in the conditions, there is a landscaping plan to be provided um, within that that courtyard and that grassed area. Yeah, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm being dense, but where is it on that? I can see that, but I can't see it on here. Oh, oh, the green bit. Is that the bit next to the refuse section? Yeah. Oh, nice to sit out there on a summer. Yeah, lovely, just where I'd like to sit, yeah. Okay. Through, through you, Chair, um, just to clarify, the, the bin storage is actually within the, the garage, so it's not external, and the external store, which you can see adjacent to the green space, is the cycle store. Or comment. Karen Lewing, then Pat. Um, if this is passed, can I please ask that there is a condition um, through the management plan that all the refuse bins are taken promptly back into the garage after the day of collection? By the residents. Yeah. Please, yes. Through you, Chair. Um, in terms of the wording of the condition, um, there's obviously the tests, and we've just discussed in terms of enforceability. Um, 
Probably a better way of phrasing it, if I may suggest, if members wish to add a condition on, would be that a refuge management plan is submitted to the council, which would indeed, which would deal with the location of where bins would be placed um, on bin days, when they would be taken back in, and that would be part of the management plan, which would then be able to be enforced rather than enforcing people not bringing them in, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. There's Paul suggesting meet with general approval on that on that particular front. Okay, right. Any other questions? Uh, conditionality, Jenny. Right. Well, we've got another car-free scheme, haven't we? They do seem to be a bit of a problem because we don't have control over them. Um, we are then reliant on. The county council doing their thing and they don't seem to be joined up with us at all so whatever promises are made here will affect the uh, local residents of a parking scheme which is already overrun and i think i'd like to knock the heads together actually of the two councils and get them to work together so that if we have a car free scheme we have a car free scheme and they don't give out permits simple as that um, and we're not there yet so that's a, that's a nuisance i understand that six will be, still be six however realistically i i think that's going to be a problem because the from what i can make out where the parking spaces are on barbon road at the moment um they, are probably, they were probably used by the people who were using the B&Bs, but also a lot of those B&Bs were used by people who were a bit longer term, let's say, and didn't have cars. So I don't think there was the, the same pressure that will inevitably come with this scheme. I worry about the lack of light in the basement and there will need to be artificial light and the cost of electricity nowadays it is problematic and having to light your home, 20, well, not 24 hours, but say 12 hours a day, now that's going to be an added um, problem as far as I'm concerned. Another issue, you know, we talked about bats, but what about swifts, for example? Now, we really need to make sure that there, aren't, there isn't a swift population there is in that area of arboretum swift colonies and we i would really like to make sure that no swifts will be damaged in this process because they take several years to um, create a home so if we can make sure that that isn't an issue either but um and the last thing i guess is the outdoor amenity area it's so tiny if 20 people got in there then i don't think they would know, be rubbing shoulders quite closely and it's going to be uh, artificial grass so it's going to be no benefit to anything much at all so i have lots of problems about the overdevelopment of this site if we could get a guarantee about the parking i would be a lot happier but i know that highways and county won't be able to give that um, assurance to this meeting so it's very problematic as far as i'm concerned for all of those reasons just once one minor point if i can just for clarity um officers are not satisfied that artificial grass will be will uh, is suitable um, and a condition has been proposed in terms of landscaping and officers will not approve artificial grass so the only other thing was the section 106 they talk about creating a new open space where there aren't that many open spaces left in that area that could be used by that local community so i'd be very interested to know where you think it's going to be in terms of the section 106 minutes it's not for creation of new space it's for the um it says creation of new space it's provision of public open space and maintenance and um, the the wording of that is slightly um 
not helpful. Um, just to clarify, it's to provide um, monies towards the existing open spaces to be able to enhance those and to, to help with the maintenance of those because of the additional burden, because of the additional numbers of people that would be using it. So it's not new space, it's for the provision of um, enhancements and maintenance to the existing open spaces. Did you want to come in? No, I, I think um, what bothers me, I, I think when, when planning policy is made, it's often, it often feels very London centric and we're all sort of conforming to a standard which is a bit alien to us out in the provinces. And that's really what I feel about this business of a basement area being used for living space. It's kind of as if we're expecting the, you know, to, to, to revert to Victorian standards and tenements or something. Uh, I appreciate that it's a bedroom and I have this horrible suspicion that on that ground it will get past a government inspector, but I, I've asked myself if this is good design, and I don't think it is because of that. I mean, I think the rest of it is, but I don't think the basement is at all. Okay. Um, what we have before us as far as seeing is we provide an alternative proposal, and we see we can discuss that and propose it in seconds, or we... Um, uh, we provide more conditions that, that we, we could um, load into the existing proposal. Um, is, is there any, anything else that members want to bring to the table that, they, that, that we could potentially put in as additional conditions? Alan? Well, the, point, the only point I'd make on that, Chair, answer to that is, isn't it a bit pointless? Because I understand the works have already started. I'm doing what they want to do. So, um, if that if that is the case, uh, could, uh, when officers have their discussions with these applicants, can they warn them? And I mean warn them that they should not undertake works for which they have not yet sought permission, because it's getting on my nerves and it gets on the nerves of this committee. And I understand works have been started. Well, at least that's what some of the objectors tell me. I don't know whether that's true or not. Through you, Chair. Um, the. The works in which the planning permission has sought has, have not begun. What they have done is, since they've taken ownership of the property, is they are doing a soft strip of things that are within the internal property. So they are stripping out some of the elements, but they certainly haven't started any development in which planning permission is required. Any further questions, comment? Karen Lee. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've just got one question. It's to do with the proposed sustainability, which to me is a little bit thin. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting image on the design and access statement, which points to the energy reuse and has got an, an arrow to the A, which I don't expect these buildings to reach. But I would expect them to reach at least a C. And to do that, I believe they would need to put some solar panels on. And I see I cannot see that on the application. Has there been any talk with the the applicant, whether they can put those on, please, or or not. Thank you. Through, through you, Chair. Um, not that I am aware of, but obviously it's within the gift of the committee, if they so wished, to add a condition for, um, for solar panels, which would um, deal with the policy in terms of ensuring that 10% of the energy requirements, that could be a reasonable condition if members so wished. Yeah. I, th I think because the building is not overlooked by or overshadowed, I think it's a, a, a good roof for that proposal. Thank you. Bring up. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to say, noted the comments from Councillor Barnes. Um, I will liaise with our traffic management people the suggestion that if we are saying it's parking free, that per permits shouldn't be issued. Yes, I that's a it's a it's a good point. I'll bring that up to the team. Thank you. Uh, no further questions, comment, ideas for conditions, Karen. In in that case, uh, Chair, um, can we investigate that as part of this permission that uh, the policy is revised so that this development doesn't have residential parking, or is it too late?
through you, Chair. Um, unfortunately, we can't. We have to consider this application in the policy context that exists right now, um, not what might um, emerge um, following those discussions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just, just for clarity, Paul, could you just remind us of the the conditions that we've sort of um, offered up, essentially, for? So in terms of the additional conditions, there is an additional condition on the late paper in terms of... Um, that was for... I'm trying to think what was on the late paper. For the Construction Environmental Management Plan. Um, so condition 12 um, would be a refuse management plan. And condition 13 would be for 10% of the energy requirements to be met, including provision of PV panels. And that's if we have a movement for approval. Through you, Chair, then we'll move to the vote. So the proposal is for um, approval of the planning permission in accord as set out in the um, officer's report with the additional conditions, the one in the late paper, the additional condition regarding the refuse management and additional condition regarding 10% of energy requirement. Um, all those in favour? One, two, all those against? Of course, sorry. yeah, sorry. Yeah. So the proposal is to approve the application as set out in the officer's report with three additional conditions. Um, there's the condition in the late paper, there's the extra condition regarding refuse management, and an additional condition regarding 10% energy requirement. And all those in favour? And we had. In favor. So, so that those in favour, please show again. Please. Th that's three. Thank you. Those against? One, two, three. And those abstaining? One, two, three. <laughs> Therefore, Chair, it's cast, you'd stand for you to have a casting vote um, because we've got a tie at the moment and we've got three, four, and three against. So you now have a choice to stick with your original vote of approval or you can change your mind and go to refusal. So you have a casting vote. Whatever you decide is now what happens with the application. So we'll, we'll, we'll approve. There we go. The application has been approved. Uh, okay. Okay, could we have a little bit of order and go to agenda item 10, please? Uh, 93 Penville Crescent, and I'll pass to Charlotte. Thank you, Chair. I'll just get through the slides to the item in a minute.
<clears throat> this application is presented to committee for determination following a councillor call in request. Permission is sought part retrospectively for the retention of a timber framed residential annex for ancillary use to 93 Penhill Crescent and the demolition of a detached garage. The slide outlined in red on the top left, sorry, the site outlined in red on the top left site location plan lies on the eastern side of Penhill Crescent in a primarily residential area. It comprises a two storey semi detached dwelling with a front garden providing off road parking and a rear garden. It is shown in its context from a bird's eye view at the bottom right of the slide with the approximate area of the rear garden outlined in red. As set out in the report, development has commenced. An outbuilding has been erected at the eastern end of the rear garden and the detached single garage has now been demolished. The layout is shown on the proposed site plan in the center of the slide. As constructed, the outbuilding has a footprint of some 33 square meters and is orientated to face towards the rear elevation of the property. Presently, it is some 2.8 meters in height. It is proposed that surface water would drain to soakaways as annotated on the site plan towards the middle of the rear garden. The land drainage partnership initially advised that this was acceptable. But due to concerns raised with regards to the uncertainty of the ground suitability for infiltration, a condition is now recommended requiring percolation tests and submission and approval of alternative drainage if it is found not to be a suitable option. The top left photograph of the front elevation of the property shows the side access to the rear garden with a garage prior to its demolition in the background, which was sited alongside the neighbouring property's garage. The top right photograph shows that three off-road parking spaces have now been provided, including an extension of the dropped curb, which meets the required parking standards set out in the streetscape design guide and which has been carried out with a licence. The top left Sorry, the bottom left photograph is a view alongside the side elevation of the property and shows the fencing between it and number 91 and the partially constructed outbuilding, which is the subject of this application in the background. The bottom right photograph shows the rear garden area with the side elevation of the neighbour's garage, the slab of the now demolished garage and the outbuilding, which is currently protected by sheeting. This application seeks permission for the retention of the outbuilding, but of an amended roof height. It is proposed to reduce the roof height of the east elevation, which is adjacent to the boundary with number 17 Sapphire Crescent, to 2.5 metres, a reduction of 30 centimetres, whilst retaining the 2.8 metre height to the west elevation, resulting in a shallow monopitched roof. The ancillary accommodation proposed to serve dependent relatives, as shown on the floor plan, would provide an open plan living area, including a kitchenette, a bedroom with ensuite shower room. The parking and garden areas would be shared between the property and the annex. It is considered that the proposed accommodation, by reason of its size, siting, design and stated purpose, would be ancillary to the use of the existing dwelling, and the recommended condition, number six, to retain it as such, meets the tests for lawfulness, including enforceability. It is proposed to clad the front elevation with light grey composite cladding, with grey galvanised metal sheeting to the remaining three elevations and a rubber roof as shown on the right hand side of the slide. The photograph at the bottom of the slide shows the outbuilding in relation to the southern boundary and the neighbour's garage to the north. The materials are considered to be acceptable for an ancillary structure and its siting in an enclosed rear garden. Given the part retrospective nature of the proposal, it is recommended that the building is clad prior to its first occupation. A key consideration is the impact of the proposal on neighbouring properties, particularly those to the east of the site, which occupy lower ground levels. The photographs at the top of the slide show the height of the existing structure relative to the fence and the neighbour's shed from the conservatory and the decking to the rear of the property. Officers have negotiated amendments to the as built structure to reduce the height of the elevation facing the boundary with number 17 Sapphire Crescent. As shown on the top left photograph and at figure four in the report, the reduced height proposed 2.5 metres would be approximately 70 centimetres above the existing fence height, approximately 1.8 metres in height. It should be noted that permitted development rights allow a fence of two metres in height in this location and an outbuilding used for purposes incidental to the enjoyment of the dwelling house of 2.5 metres in height, where it is within two metres of a boundary. 
In comparison to these fallback positions, the proposed reduced height of the outbuilding is considered to be acceptable. In addition, the appearance would be softened from that shown on the photographs when externally clad as proposed and through the inclusion of landscaping to the rear, which is recommended as a condition. It is considered that the remaining garden would provide sufficient shared amenity space for the existing property and the proposed ancillary accommodation. Comparison of the top two photographs show the rear garden before and after demolition of the garage and construction of the ancillary building, which demonstrates this. The photograph at the bottom of the slide shows the proximity of the proposed annex to the dwelling and its interrelationship. To conclude, the principle of providing ancillary accommodation to the existing dwelling is considered to be acceptable. The proposal would be subservient in both its use and scale to the principal building on the site. Whilst the ancillary accommodation is not provided in an, in an extension to the existing dwelling as set out in the design guide, nonetheless, due to its size, siting and dependency, it is considered to be ancillary. It is officer's opinion that the proposed modifications to reduce the height of the outbuildings roof nearest to the eastern boundary ensures that it would not have a material adverse impact on the living conditions of neighbours, particularly when taking into account the permitted development rights for outbuildings and fencing. It is therefore recommended that planning permission is granted subject to the conditions as set out in the report. Thank you, Chair. Charlotte, thank you. Um, Councillor Udall. Thank you, Chair. It's me again. Uh, for a start, I'd like to confirm that I've got no concerns about parking uh, at this, on this application. Um, it's, I have got a bit of a, a dilemma with this application because I can see both the case of the objector and the applicant here, and I've spoken to both. Uh, but we do have to remember that this is a retrospective application and something which we should not be encouraging. We should make sure uh, that we, we are conscious of that in our decision making. I do think there's some hope of compromise with this application, uh, and I would seek some support from members on, uh, on additional conditions, uh, which would actually make this whole situation a little bit more acceptable to the main objector who lives at 17 Sapphire Crescent. Uh, I believe the requirement to reduce the height of the building to 2.5 metres is only at its shortest point. It will still be 2.8 metres at the front and will slope down. So 2.5 metres will only be uh, 2.5 metres will only be at the rear of the of the building because it has a pitch roof. Um, 2.5 metres and a flat roof would throughout the whole building would be much better. Also, some other suggestions: the objector objects to having to see an unsightly galvanised metal, which would overshadow her garden. She would like you to consider a condition that the entire building should be timber clad which would soften the visual impact of the development mention has been made about her planting at the rear of the building but there is very insufficient space there for planting and the maintenance of the planting so there would be a requirement for space to be provided for maintenance of any trees or vegetation uh, so it can be maintained from 92 Penal Crescent and not from the neighbouring property. And this has been mentioned, the soil in both streets is almost pure clay. The objector is still very worried about the consequences of water drain off, which would cause problems in her garden. She is requesting consideration to ensure uh, a um, condition of guttering on the building, which would uh, be attached to a water butt. Any surface water would then, would, would then drain off safely and would not cause her any potential damage. Funny, the biggest concern about the use of the building is its actual residential use. Uh, obviously, it will be auxiliary to the main property, but I believe a further condition should be considered, which would prevent any commercial rental of that space, such as an Airbnb or a student let, which could still happen even if it's auxiliary to the main building. So there should not be any private rental opportunity on that site. If you could consider these uh, as extra conditions, both I and the objector would be very grateful. Thank you. Uh, Paul, is there anything you particularly wanted to, or, or Charlotte, about the, the points that Richard made? Um, through you, Chair, sorry. Mm. We're, we're, <laughs> we're confused of who was going to speak. Um, in terms of the, the conditions, um, <clears throat> in terms of the occupation, there is a condition that requires it to be only occupied 
in conjunction with the, the property. That would exclude separate let. But um, in terms of the wording of the condition, that certainly can be looked at um, with the vice, in, vice chair and chair in terms of making sure that that is tight, as uh, Councillor Udall says. But in, in terms of that condition proposed, that is what that intends to do, and it would preclude it. Any further questions or comment? Alan Amos? A quick one, Chair, to reinforce that point. Uh, my, my concern was about the actual intended use of this, and I notice in paragraph 7.6, it says the occupants would regularly be preparing and eating meals with the family in the main dwelling. So, of course, it does raise the question of why you've got the kitchen in there. So I, I'm deeply suspicious of what the real intention is. So we need to thwart that by making the condition watertight. Because I'm sure the fact that it's retrospective as well is that the actual intention is not what we, we might be giving planning permission for. It's intended. Yeah. Uh, any further questions? Marjorie. Um, I, I just, I'd just like to um, uh, have a definition of utilities. In, in uh, paragraph 3.3, it says there will be no separate address post box utilities. Does this mean no, no, presumably it means no gas, no electricity. So it's not going to be a very pleasant place to be in the winter. No water. Thank you, Chair. If I can just confirm that the shared um, facilities would include the gas, any gas supply, electricity supply and water supply. What it means is it wouldn't have its own separate metered supply. It would be ancillary to the house. The property effectively would still be a single property, um, much in the way if it was extended, it, it's just a detached building providing that ancillary accommodation rather than being attached. And whilst that might cause some concerns, condition six is quite explicit. Uh, it might be helpful if I just read it out in full. It says the development hereby permitted shall not be occupied at any time other than for purposes ancillary to the resident, oh, sorry, residential use of the dwelling known as 93 Penhill Crescent. The development shall not be used as an independent self-contained dwelling separate from the dwelling known as 93 Penhill Crescent. So officer's opinion is that does ensure that if it were used as a separate dwelling or as a holiday let, that isn't ancillary to 93 Penhill Crescent, there would be a breach of that condition and enforcement action could be taken. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think part of our problem here is the prose description, as it were. I mean, this, this thing talks about the, it is proposed that the building will provide ancillary accommodation for the applicant's parents who are dependent, etc., etc. Um, I mean, it's what, what I, 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 perhaps you're not allowed to call granny flats these days, but it sounds very much like that. And it sounds like an excellent way of keeping a family together um, and, uh, and, uh, and for the uh, grown up children of, uh, of, uh, of people to be able to be on hand to take care of them. I think it's an excellent use. But I totally accept Council, well, I don't totally accept uh, uh, Council Udall's uh, 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 suggestions for, for conditions because I think it is quite clear it's ancillary. It's ancillary to the main building, and that, by definition, is part of it. Not saying we don't need it, Richard, but, but we, we shouldn't do it. But you don't need it because it's there. Uh, but the other ones, on, on that basis, I would uh, move the recommendations as uh, as put. Thank you. There is clearly some impact on on the residents of Number Seventeen Sapphire Crescent, and that's not particularly desirable. Uh, so anything that can be done to mitigate that, I would welcome. But I, th I think with 0.8 metres, there's not much you could do except paint it a different colour, probably, to blend in. Um, but I'm also mindful of the fact that if you look at page 90, there is a, a fallback position mentioned, uh, which is to say that if we, we, we have the opportunity here to control this development a little bit, uh, whereas if we refused it, they could build something rather worse. So I, I would just sort of mention that to members, uh, that this is our opportunity. If you want to say something about conditioning it, I'm not sure what I would do to condition it. I, I haven't got any ideas there. I think perhaps only the guttering that was mentioned might be something that, that ought to be looked at so that nobody gets anything, you know, 
any water spewing over the fence or anything. Thank you. Yeah, I certainly think the guttering is going to be vital because the water drain off against that fence will otherwise impact quite significantly. Uh, and I'd like to make sure that there's no further permitted development on that building. So if it does have, if they come back in a few months time and say, um, Granny's died, <laughs> sounds horrible, but that they can't then say, oh, we're going to turn it into an Airbnb because it looks like an Airbnb to me. And I think I would want it to come back here if, if the circumstance change. With the concerns of the drainage off the roof, can I suggest that the client changes the roof to be a green roof, which would have some capacity for storage and also help with biodiversity? Thank you. Through you, Chair, um, just a couple of points, if I, if I can. Um, in terms of the green roof, um, that's not before members. And in terms of conditions, um, we have to be careful that we haven't got a structural survey with this building to to um, advise this committee of whether this the structure is capable of taking a green roof now i appreciate that that could be done but that's not what's before members um and it's not something that could simply be conditioned it would need to have further details submitted in terms of the green roof and, and this is one of the problems of it being a retrospective planning application i would I would like to warrant and if it had come properly we could have a better building thank you um, through you chair just to, to complete um whether it is retrospective or not um we would still need that that details because you couldn't just impose a green roof on a, a wooden building um, in terms of the guttering and the water butts um, suggestion that could be built into the drainage condition in terms of percolation tests but also other ways of storing water um, and in terms of the the overall appearance it's for members to be able to consider if they consider that the metal cladding is suitable in terms of the area or other cladding provisions if they wish to to look at those as as an alternative if they're looking at an alternative view councillor Udall has suggested alternative but being mindful that there are building regulations requirements in terms of combustibility adjacent to boundaries um, that would be something that needed to be investigated a little bit further In brief, Chair, I, I, if we can add the conditions which have been talked about, the guttering, I would certainly suggest that there should be some conditions regarding the cladding, and I think a, a metal, a cast iron metal, galvanised metal uh, boundary is not a good uh, cladding, and it does need to have probably timber cladding on there instead. Uh, that would certainly be welcomed by, by the objectors, and the guttering would include that, obviously. So I, I, if those could be included, I have got that remaining concern about the 0.8 of a metre between the boundary and what can realistically be planted there, uh, which can actually be maintained, so it doesn't actually grow uh, over the neighbouring property and then cannot be maintained by the property which where the applicant is from. So I would have some concern about that, but I'm sure you can use some language to guarantee that that doesn't happen. I'd seek clarification on that. And those few few points, please, Chair. In terms of landscaping, um, landscape condition, landscaping condition, um, we will look at suitable species. Um, I think the the idea is that it will grow up as part of the building in terms of a framework obviously we can't condition that the the plants won't grow over the the neighboring properties it'd be uh, so how yes uh, in terms of a maintenance but that would be a normal maintenance of how you would normally maintain your property it's not something that i think would be reasonable on this this condition on this side of the room gentlemen no um in which case i cladding yeah. Uh, through, through you, Chair, yes, that is a, a something, but obviously, Councillor Udall, that's not in your gift to be able to put no. that forward. Well, that, uh, uh, yes. Council, Councillor Roberts has, has, put, has moved approval already, mm -hmm. and we're waiting for a seconder, so yeah. it's whether that can be mocked up as part of the additional conditions. So, so moving the, the proposal, can we have a seconder, please? Pass Agar. 
he asked. Uh, just for clarity, Andy, as you have proposed them, could, could, could we just have a quick run through of the conditionality, please, Paul, just to... Um, so I believe where we're at is that, um, that we've got an additional um, adjunct to the existing drainage condition in terms of guttering and water butts, um, that we would look for wooden cladding in terms of the materials. I think that's right. And then in terms of the occupation condition, it was suggested that that is agreed with the chair and vice chair. Through, through you then, Chair, um, proposal is for approval um, with the additional amendment and amended conditions. All those in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those against? One. Commission's granted, Chair. Thank you.